Hello, Yeshua Network. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I had to cough. That's how I, that's how I start off a video. I just cough right in your ears. <laughs> oh, I roll. Cough, 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 cough. Thank you guys for your patience. Um, had to do a little extra praying today, and I had some issues with my earbuds, so hopefully my ears, my sound ends up being good for tonight. Thank you all for showing up. <clears throat> also, yeah. really quick while everybody's logging on, we do have lots of new groups. I want to encourage you guys, there's going to be a lot more groups coming. Uh, so head on over to the groups. Just click the link when you're at Yeshua Official. You'll see the buttons at the top, the words at the top. One of them should say group. If not, click on the three dots, then hit groups. There's a ton of them. We have a lot more coming, and we hope that each each person with each need in the body of Christ will find a place and find a home and um, and a place where they can fellowship and, and get nourished in the spirit by the will of God when they come to Yeshua Network. That's our hope. All right. Amen. Amen. So Amen. check that out. <clears throat> uh, looks like uh, everyone's ready to roll here. Um so awesome. good to Let's be do back it. with you guys. We love you so much, and thank you for yes. being here with us. So uh, let's get started. Mark 9, general comments. Oguchuku, general comment. When I heard Ricardo's comment being read two weeks ago regarding Mark 6, verse 7, something stood out to me, which I am still pondering on, in relation to the disciples going out in twos. It reads, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth, by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. This then led me to Genesis 7, 2, which reads, Of every clean beast thou shalt take two, thee, by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, uh, the male and his female. Uh, the Genesis passage mentions the unclean beast going into the ark by two, whereas Mark's passage refers to the disciples going out to the world by two to use authority over unclean spirits. The first group is to be saved from global destruction, and the second is to save others from possessive destruction. This is something I, I may look into at a later date, as it was just something that crossed my mind, which may or may not have any meaning to it. Well, Oguchuku, we've been doing this long enough now to say, I feel, I, I am persuaded to say that if something has crossed your mind, it is probably not because it is meaningless. <laughs> so I am interested in what more you might find out about this and say in the future, but that sounds very interesting and something I would, if, if it had crossed my mind, I would look into as well. I like it, Oguchuku. I like it a lot. <clears throat> I do think that's interesting. Thank you for taking the time to point it out and not being shy, by the way. I want to commend you for not being shy and holding that back, you know, just sharing it. It's got my brain thinking already, so I like mm -hmm. it. So thank you very much. Absolutely. It blesses us. Absolutely. All right. So kicking it off, the actual, you know, that was a general comment. So kicking it off with Mark 9. Our first comment is from Dan Richardson, Mark 9, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Is this a promise to the disciples of what their work on earth will be after the day of Pentecost? Question mark. Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judah and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, we know we have a few comments on this one, but I, I'm just going to say in short, I'm persuaded that that's what he was talking about. Uh, myself is is particularly the day of Pentecost and them seeing the power. Uh, but there's other people. So let's see. Let's see what else is is, uh, is possible in the scriptures. Amen. Yep. <clears throat> Oguchuku, Mark 9, 1, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some that stand here. Sh My brother just read this one. So mm -hmm. this verse makes, uh, this verse, verse makes, took, oh, this verse took me to John chapter 21, 22 through 23, which reads, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Yeshua loved, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Yeshua, Lord, 
And what shall this man do? Yeshua saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that the disciple should not die. Yet Yeshua said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? We know that the book of Revelation was when John wrote his visions of the end, which also included the coming of the Messiah in chapter 20. So I wonder whether Yeshua was referring to John as one of the people he was ref referring to in Mark 9, 1, and whether he, was talking, whether he was talking to us as the current readers, kind of like double meaning scripture. Um, to better understand, yes, I, I love your comment. And for me, to better understand it, I'd like to go to John 21 real quick. Um, yeah, so it explains here, actually, just like you're pointing out. Yeah, you already wrote the scripture. I'm just rereading it. Uh, it explains that the disciple should not die. Yet Yeshua said not unto him, he shall not die. So, you know, up until right now, there is that. It, there was that possibility in my mind that there that Yeshua is talking about John and that John is one of the two witnesses. Well, it seems to me that John chapter 21, verse 22, 23, um, kind of tells us that that probably is not the case. Because it says, yet Yeshua said not unto him, he shall not die. Um... Although, of course, that could be interpreted as the two witnesses do die. Anyway, sorry. That was a mental tangent I didn't mean to have just now. <laughs> um, but it's along the lines of what you're asking, Oguchuku. So there you go. You've just a window into my chaotic mental process. You're welcome. I like it. It's all good. <laughs> I think it's good. I love the conversation. I love the fact that we can talk about these things in the EBRT. It's like the best thing ever in the whole wide world. It's great. Indeed. Greatness among us, uh, within us, is great. So cool. <clears throat> I, um, I'm still there. We have another one from Ricardo. So let's read that and then maybe we can talk more about it if anybody else has other ideas too. Ricardo, Mark 9 1, and he said, <clears throat> and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Why, oh, why the dude who cuts gospels in chapters did this? <laughs> the first, you're talking about the titles? This verse definitely should be uh, Mark oh, 8, 39. Yeah, I agree with you. That's I don't know why it was put in Mark 9. Uh, but on the other hand, God only knows why. But reading after this EBRT and reading this verse totally out of context made me think that this was about John the disciple, but not in the way we talked about before in Matthew, that this might be a hint of John being one of the two witnesses. See, Alex just was talking about that. But more like a technicality. It says, which shall not taste death until seeing the kingdom of God come with power. And John kind of sort of did. Don't remember exactly if John got a vision or if he was taken somewhere, but this is what John wrote. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with me, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, their God. So John indeed died. But he did not taste death before or what he saw, which was indeed the kingdom of God coming with power, which was what Yeshua said, technically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Alex. What you got? Well, that's, you're reading stuff and thinking that things. that well, <laughs> my my uh, my brain activity is deceptive then. Um, uh, <laughs> that's it for nine. That's it for nine one. So I think you're free now to speak whatever you wanted to speak about that. Um, I just want to say that, you know, I've always heard that the John of Revelation is not the same John the Apostle. Um, and I have no confirmation one way or the other, other than to say, well, if it was John the Apostle, then he would have had to have lived 200 plus years. Um, 
I think that's I think that's the consensus that Revelation was originated 200 AD or something like that. Um, is that right? Is that what you remember? Uh, no, it's it's like 90s, 80, 80s or 90s AD. Really? He, he and crazy old though for like back then, dude. Like so, so if jo- so if Revelation was 80 or 90 AD, it could be John the Apostle. Could be if he's really, but he'd be really old for back then. Yeah, yeah, it could be. But it, most scholars and researchers and stuff do say that the John, John the Apostle, is not the one that wrote the Gospel of John or the Rev, Book of Revelation. I always thought it was because it, you know, I always thought it was. But I, I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know. Uh, well, maybe it's something we will get to find out as we continue because i don't know either um there is no indication that it isn't him in the in the in the text well, itself is he yeah does he refer to himself as the one that yeshua loves in the in the god in the revelation i don't no. think so no he doesn't so that's that's the thing is like did he become humble <laughs> and he stopped using that term or <laughs> or is it a different guy you get what i'm saying so it's just again i i don't think anybody can stand in full knowledge and say you know what it is you know what i mean right um i do i do like though i mean I, it's okay to like a thing and i really like what ricardo said you know this john who wrote the book of revelation did indeed see this vision right and it is interesting that technically it was fulfilled, but it, it the, the, but it does say what if. If Yeshua says what if, what is it to you or what if I said. So he's not saying it is so. And I'm glad that the scripture itself does clarify that for us. Like it's like it gets us off the hook of thinking like even if Yeshua says a what if, then we have to think, oh, so that means that it, it means it is happening because Yeshua plain said it, right? But Yeshua gives all sorts of strange parables and stuff like that too, right? So it's like, you know, he yeah. does use analogies that doesn't necessarily mean it actually physically happened somewhere in the world. So, yeah, I, I think this whole thing is pretty interesting. However, um, you know what? I mean, we're all just throwing out our persuasions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see some live comments up here too. I, I am in, of the persuasion that Dan wrote. I, I am persuaded that when they saw the power of the Lord come and they also saw Yeshua ascend, like the totality of it. And, and Yeshua is constantly saying, which we're going to read, he's constantly saying the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. So, um, you know, when they get the power from the Holy Ghost on Pentecost, it's to me that like fulfills that, right? Like, so... And I think it's interesting. I'll just I'll just I'll just say it real quick. So it's interesting because in in the Gospel of John, Yeshua is having a conversation with God, and he says, "I'm having this conversation with you, not because like I need to, but but I'm doing it for the sake of those who are watching me, which are the apostles, right?" And then he says, "You have given them to me, and I have protected them while I've been with them." So that's really interesting. That's something I know I'm getting way ahead of us. But it ties in kind of with this. He's saying that I have protected them while they while I have been with them. But now I'm going to go and I'm going to go be with you. And I'm asking you, Lord, to protect them. And don't take them out of the world, but keep them in the world so that they can do what they need to do. This, in my opinion, matches with basically Yeshua's desire for them to stay alive until they get the Holy Ghost. And then once they get the Holy Ghost... I mean, Simon, it's, it's it's one of the Simons, right? He gets killed, like, immediately. As soon as, like, the day of Pentecost happens, is it Simon? Is the other Simon who gets killed immediately? What's his name? So whoever the first apostle was, he gets, like, stoned to death. And, like, I don't know, not very long after getting the Holy Ghost, kind of stinks. <clears throat> so my point is to say is, like, I don't know why I'm having a brain fart on that one. It's bothering me. Uh, but anyways, that's old age, I guess. So, uh, but th- this is a thing that just ties it in with me. So that, that's my persuasion is Book of Acts, uh, Pentecost is it. So, but that's that. Let's see what you guys are saying. Tracy says, so you're saying that the vision and dreams could be how some would see Yeshua returning? Uh, yes, Stephen, guys. I think it is Stephen. 
Stephen. I said Simon. Yeah. I knew it's hard with an S. But Thank I don't you, know guys. if Stephen was one of the twelve. I don't think he was. But it doesn't matter. Yeah. He he definitely had the Holy Ghost. Um. Sorry, I was just answering because people were saying Stephen, Stephen, Stephen. I didn't mean to interrupt what you were saying. Oh, it was James who was the first one to die. Okay. But I think I was thinking of Stephen who got stoned. Yeah, early, early, early. Okay, cool. Good. All that got worked out. See? Teamwork makes that holy dream work. Look -a -look -a -look. Okay. <clears throat> See, if you're having a brain fart, folks, okay, or the wheels, the cogs, they need a little greasing, you know, everything is running kind of rusty. When you have your brothers and sisters around you and everybody's got their Bibles out, you know, it's really easy for the for the gaps to get filled up, okay? This is why the hand can't say to the foot, I do not need you. Because you never know how you might spend 90% of your days of the year in brain fog. You know what I mean? So this is why you need people around you, guys. This is great. Okay. Indeed. <clears throat> Dan Richardson, Revelation written AD 90 through 96. Scholars are mixed on if it's John the Apostle wrote it. Yeah, I think it's a split thing. So Stephen... Uh I have a, a an inkling, a feeling, I don't know, whatever, a theory as to why 9-1 is in 9-1 rather than 8-39, whatever it is that it would have been. Ooh, okay. Because, because I myself have heard a person who grew up in a very Christian family and who went to church and who witnessed um, his sister die in a car accident very tragically. Um that person uh very very knowledgeable per very, very uh, uh scholarly human being uh very respectable nice good nice man he spent his whole life uh becoming very knowledgeable in so many sciences and histories and all kinds of things so he's quite respectable but um this is exactly the sentence that he would call upon of course his experiences colored everything but this is exactly the passage that he would point to to claim that the bible can't be telling the truth verily i say mm. unto you that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of god come with power he assumed that meant the stuff promised in matthew 24 the stuff of revelation all that stuff and that had not happened and he assumed that everything in revelation was uh talking about rome and of course rome did not fall in the way that it is described in the in the in the book and that all led him to believe that in fact the bible is just not telling the truth um so maybe that's why this this sentence lives out here at the beginning of this chapter so it could potentially be a stumbling block i don't know maybe that's why easy, easy to find therefore easy to recall for argument is that what yeah saying? Mm -hmm. I like that. <clears throat> I like that theory. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. I'm sure there's a lot more we could talk about this. I have a feeling we will talk more about it as we continue to read other passages about it. Um, especially as we read certain things that Yeshua says. Mary says, you know what they say about assuming. I do. Who assumed? Yeah. Was it me? No, no. I, was, I, I I said that he assumed. Uh oh. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, the story I was talking right. about this this gentleman. God bless him. I, I wish him well. He was a good guy. Good guy. Good guy. Um, praise the Lord. We pray for him in Yeshua's name. Uh, Mark 9, Sarah Peterson, verse 2 through 10. I've always found it interesting that the two people at the Mount of Transfiguration with Yeshua are Moses and Elijah. I have always found that interesting too. Both of these people have encountered God on top of the mountain. Moses asked to see God's face on Mount Horeb in Exodus 33, verse 21 through 23, say this. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cliff in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back but my face must not be seen. And then in 11 Kings 19, 11, 1 Kings 19, Elijah runs to Mount Horeb as he is fleeing from Jezebel 
after destroying the prophets of Baal, there Elijah also has God pass by him. First Kings 19.11 says, The Lord said, go out, stand on the mountain in front of me. I am going to pass by. In Mark chapter 9, it only says that they went to a high mountain for the transfiguration. Is it possible that they are on Mount Horeb also? I'm not saying this is actually true, but kind of imagined in my mind that there may that maybe there was some sort of time portal on the mountain. And perhaps Elijah and Moses encountered Yeshua at the Mount of Transfiguration from their own times. And God let them see him as the son of man. Maybe it's not actually true, but it seemed to make sense to me. Or maybe since both Elijah and Moses died in the presence of the Lord, well, Elijah ascended and didn't even die. Maybe the first thing they got to do after their lives on earth were done was to go see Yeshua, the promised Messiah, living on earth and fulfilling all of his promises. Really amazing to me. Would love to know everyone's thoughts on this, especially, uh, obviously, I'm not set on these ideas being absolutely true necessarily. I just thought maybe it would be cool if it was. See, that's all I was saying about Ricard. I like what he said. I think it'd be cool. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying here, Sarah. Um, I am in school. I, I like this idea. I mean, it's pretty cool. Um, I do too, because when you we, just... we don't Sorry. know, so yeah, no, I, I don't, I'm just like, is this a cool idea? I, there's nothing really for me to say, so you guys, I'm, I, I just think it's it's a really cool idea. There's really no way for us to know, but I, I you know, what's so funny though, I do want to say it's the reason why I'm having a hard time is because I've kind of thought that about Elijah or at least like about basically like almost all the, the, the prophets or the, you know, all the people of the Bible that were like substantial stuck out. There's a book about them. Right. I imagine that when they died, like God kind of did like a, Hey, this is what it was all for kind of movie in front of them or something. You know what I mean? Like th I've always kind of imagined that. And I don't think I've ever shared that with anybody. So what's really cool to me is to see Sarah talking about this right now. And she's kind of having this, idea about it in this so that that's the reason why my brain was clogging again you know rusty clogs so there you go that's my two cents go for it Alex. no i was just gonna say i love your uh i love what you're imagining here because uh it it does kind of fit i i agree with you nathan i it's it's a it's a notion where i feel like uh the prophets were all waiting for messiah the prophets understood that that time would come one day and uh, for them to go out way before he ever got there and not know about it seems kind of seems kind of anticlimactic. So so, yeah, the idea that the idea that they were meeting Yeshua. In as, their time, in their time or right at they were having that experience right right after they passed on to, you know, the other side and they were meeting him there and having a conversation with him and, and God was showing them that this is him this is my son and um, and at the same time the three apostles got to witness that whole thing and they were completely terrified and had no idea what they were doing there and what to do with it <laughs> which would also make sense you know what I mean it's almost as if he took him he took him with them he he took the the three guys with him on this business trip he had to go do right. on top of Mount Horeb where he was going to actually do that whole thing where he was going to be introduced to Elijah and Moses and uh and they got to witness it and they were just like ah we'll build you some tabernacles bro what do we do you know <laughs> something like that <laughs> You know, because yeah, this is actually this is actually super fascinating. Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead, but well, because it just, it just feels like if it was only for them three, yeah, there would be more to say or more to learn or more revelation than just seeing that. It's almost like they got to witness some heavenly business in action. Yeah, exactly. Like now that now that Sarah, now you're saying this, I'm I'm tripping. I gotta admit, I'm kind of tripping because think about it too, right? If she was walking around normal Joe. And then all of a sudden he's like perfectly white clothes. Like that's, that's already the image that we have, you know, post 2000 years Bible, right? That's the image we have that when we die, there is our Lord in all this white heavenly perfect clothes, kind of no dirt on him kind of thing. Right. 
And it says that nothing on earth could clean him. And then the other thing was, is God had already said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him when he, when he got baptized. So right. why is it happening again for the guys who were already heard this? It would make sense if it was the first time that Elijah and Moses were hearing it. And it was both of their deaths or both of their transfigurations or whatever you want to call it. Moses died, but, you know, Elijah's transfiguration. But it was that moment for both of them right after that happened. And it is a time, at a time thing. And what if it is one of the messages that, they're, that, that Yeshua is trying to give to Peter and James? And who, who's the third one that's there with them? John, right? Is it John? Okay. So think about these three guys. Right. James is the first one to go. Peter is Peter and John is John. And if, it, if he ends up, being Did I get that right. Out. I just want to make sure I got that right. Cause maybe it's not John. Hold on. Peter and Jacob, Jacob. Yes, it is John. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So my point is to say is like, this kind of makes sense because he was in a very heavenly, like you said, business. He was yeah. like, he was like showing them like, this is, this is what I'm going to do for everybody when it all goes. And the other thing that's crazy is, is that because he had not gone on the cross yet, he hadn't gone to show yet to get everybody out. So it wouldn't mess up the timeline if you were back to futuring this. I'm just saying, like, this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the yeah, more yeah. I think about it, the more it makes a heck of a lot of sense, Sarah. I, I, I'm actually... Uh, I'm fascinated by it. You know what? Because, the, because... I'm super fascinated oh, by this. Oh, oh. Because Simon, other, James, and John. Yeah, go ahead. Because buddy. the other saints rose post resurrection. The other saints rose post resurrection, so they did get to see Yeshua post resurrection on earth presented as Messiah, right? Wait, uh, what other saints? We know about. You know how uh, at the end of Matthew we read about how the the some of the dead woke up. Oh, you mean when Yeshua died on the cross? Yes. When he Yeah, they're walking he, the streets of Jerusalem, yeah. When he was resurrected, right? The, yeah. There was a bunch of the, there's a bunch that saw him and he saw them. Yeah. Well, in this case, just so Elijah and Moses could be the first to see Messiah, mm. they got to see him pre-cross. I see that. But then I and I know we're going on a tangent here, but but then what did the per what did the, the the manifestation of the human form of God look like when he had a picnic with Abraham and Sarah? So is that is I'm all, I've always been persuaded that he, he, they saw Yeshua, right? But but then the thing is is like if he did see Yeshua, is that why Abraham's not there with Moses and Elijah? And it's only the two of them because Abraham already saw him. Right. Well, Abraham also hung out with Melchizedek, and Yeshua says he is in that priesthood of Melchizedek. So maybe that's related to that Abraham already knew him. Mm. Yeah, it's crazy, right? A lot of these are really cool things. I love this conversation. This is fantastic stuff. I, I'm so glad you spoke up, Sarah. This is great. See how wonderful this is? You know what I'm saying? I, just, I like to yeah. point out the wonderfulness of the ABRT. It's so wonderful. The Greek says, this is Tracy Parker Live says, the Greek says that Yeshua was transformed before them and his garments became shining very white. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Abraham saw three men standing when he was at the front of the tent, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. He did. Okay. Uh, you want to read Jennifer Colley? Very cool stuff, guys. Yes. Um, one second. Sorry. Go ahead. You read Jennifer. Okay. So same scripture. Um, then she ties it in with, uh, I, she says, I love this, says New King James. Uh, his clothes became exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer can whiten them. Dan 7, 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow and their hair on, of his head like pure wool. Like his throne was like the fiery flame and his heels as burning fire. Come on now. 
and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 118. Now that's cleansing power. <laughs> she says, who is he meeting with? I'm tripping out on the symbolism. <laughs> he said, yeah, right? Moses, law, Elijah, prophet. Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy 6. She continues on. Uh, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, the, the Shema. God the Father, the Israelites, uh, experienced God's central saving act, the deliverance from slavery in Egypt. Moses also related God's instructions on how to commemorate that deliverance, the Passover. God the Son, the meaning of the name Yeshua is Yahweh is salvation or Yahweh saves. God the Holy Spirit, the Elijah anointing is for every believer, not just prophets. It is manifested through the actions of the Holy Spirit in order to establish God's kingdom and salvation message to men. Bam! Killing it right now, Jennifer. The glory of the Lord come in to give authority to his word. And then in an assistant, poof, just Yeshua. In an instant, poof, just Yeshua. This is so awesome. I wish I was there. Yeah, that'd be pretty awesome. Uh, Mark 9, 7 continues. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them and a voice came out uh, saying, this is my, my beloved son. Hear him. Exodus 40, 34 then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Glory, hallelujah. Oh, I forgot the best part. Don't tell anybody. Wow. I am glad I get to keep revisiting this. It's one of my favorites now. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is really good. Yeah. It, it, it also goes to show us that it's it i feel like it's it's i i can't even form a sentence it, yeah, what i'm not the only one yeah <laughs> it feels like i think this is kind of telling us that yeshua's place yeshua's messiah hood his holiness was not actually even contingent like it, he didn't receive his glory as as a reward of going through the cross there wasn't like a reward it wasn't like a, there's a carrot and a stick situation he had the capacity to go and be his fully glorious self, at least for this episode. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it kind of goes back to what he said to uh, uh, Peter, as Peter tried to defend him with a sword. And he said, uh, do you not think I could have an army of angels, like, come down right now and do all the stuff you want me to do? Mm -hmm. Um and I think this is kind of another another testament to that. You know what I mean? I do. I think it's interesting that you, you just said what you said, because you know there's denominations that believe that Yeshua was not Yeshua, that he was a normal person, got baptized, so he was the first one to get his sins washed clean, which is why we don't know the childhood and teenage years of Yeshua. And then they teach, too, that he got the Holy Ghost and therefore, then he became like the, the possibility of Yeshua. And then he goes out to the 40 day, you know, desert and he gets tested, but he passes the test. So then God like gives him confirmation. So like, and then when he dies, then he gets kind of the reward, if you will, and becomes the Messiah fully. And that, and then he, you know, does what he does. So I know the face you're making is the face I made when I heard that too. God bless everybody who has their opinions and their ideas and stuff. But I think when you read it, I think things like this jump out at you, like you just said, and it proves that he was, as he said he was, of course, to me, which undoes everything that I just explained that these denominations claim, is when he says, before Abraham was, I am, right? And those who have seen the Father have seen me. And when he gets mad at Thomas, wait, or gets mad at the guys, he's like, why are you asking to see the Father? I've been with you this whole time. So, and then this, the fact that, you know, he can literally, no matter what, whether these guys, whether he opened up a time warp portal thing to where they, in their afterlife status, were seeing him, and then he was there with the, the apostles at the same time, whether that was a time thing, or whether he just called their spirits, right? It's regardless. It's right. a full-on God act, because he's intentionally doing it. 
Right. It wasn't something that he went to do, did a prayer, did a ritual. He didn't he didn't sacrifice an animal. He didn't do any temple duties or activities. He didn't do anything that anybody else in the Bible had ever done when, you know, trying to invoke a relationship or an experience with God. He just walked up and then it boom, it happens. Right. Total God mode. Right. So it's like, yeah, he's. I, I, I think it's super important what you're pointing out on. It's super important. And yeah. and it is interesting because there's people that don't know that there's denominations that think Yeshua grew into being Messiah. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, I could see how people would think that. I could yeah. see how people want to make that calculus happen in their head. Um, but, yeah, that I don't believe that is correct. Um, to put it mildly. <laughs> um Ricardo, in real time, Genesis 18, 1 and 2, and Jehovah appears to him among the oaks of Mamre, and he's sitting at the opening of the tent about the heat of the day, and he lifts up his eyes and looks, and behold, three men standing by him, and he sees and runs to meet them from the opening of the tent and bows himself toward earth. I mean, Abraham knew exactly who it was that just showed up. Yeah. Yeah. He knew, um, as if he had seen him before. Yeah. Abraham was very casual with him, like, hey, nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah. It's like, sandwich? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I get a kick out of the fact that they ate sandwiches, but I do. Yeah. Was it, was it, <laughs> it, it's the equivalent of the ancient sandwich. It's a picnic of, like, I think, wasn't it lamb? They had some lamb? Yeah. That yeah, sounds, I don't know what it was. But, that sounds but good it's right the cash, What I'm saying is the casualness in which he was just yeah. like, picnic? Yeah, Hang yeah, out yeah. with us? What you yeah. know? He's like, and then your wife is your wife sassing me? No, yeah. Lord, no. <laughs> yes, yeah. very human. It's just a very human yeah. experience. I'm sorry, I'm getting off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. To me, it's one of the funniest moments. Is Sarah in the Bible. laughing at me right now? Is she yeah, laughing, she's laughing right at now? me? <laughs> is she doubting me and laughing at my face? <laughs> just like, no, no, Lord, she would never do that. Yeah, a euro. Uh, uh, they're eating, they're Lord, eating if, euros. if there's ten good <laughs> like people, will you not blow it up? You know. Yeah, well, there's 50 yeah. good ones. Will you leave it alone? 20? Okay, how yeah. about 10? All right, don't ask the whole thing. More. The whole thing is an SNL scare. Yeah. Anything about it's, it? Really. It's literally it's 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 something out of you know Mel Brooks. In Mel Brooks, yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's I'm so sorry, it is we're, very running our, we're, we're running our tangents here. Oh, hilarious. Yeah. How about then? <laughs> um, this was great. Uh, Sharon Louise Roberts, Mark 9, verse 5 and 6. Um, <laughs> Jennifer Connelly says Euro. <laughs> I know, that's what I'm saying. They're having Euro. They're, they're having Euro. <laughs> Did you say that? Like, I was, I I, was, no, I, well, I read her comment so while you were reading. Uh, yeah. uh, Euro? Euro? <laughs> God, the lamb Euro. sandwich, Lord? <laughs> you know, want a lamb sandwich? We're just Euros right now. You're down? <laughs> Sarah made some good lamb sandwiches, Jehovah, which is yeah. my point. Um, oh, Sharon Louise Roberts, Mark 9, verse 5 through 6. Um, these couple of verses with Peter's response to the transfiguration. Um, uh, he must have been really overwhelmed and decided to be practical by suggesting the tabernacles. I'm not sure what my response would be in that situation, probably speechless. When we read about the disciples' experiences, I can see the purpose of them being a witness to these events that take place. I perceive that this would also increase their faith for their future walk, especially as they are the first ones to start casting seeds. Mm -hmm. This is probably why throughout history, some people have more intense experiences than others. They may have a specific job to do where their life is chosen and mapped out. Some of us get disgruntled because we don't get these experiences, but some people may have been chosen for something that could be quite intense in their walk. But then that could also change at any time during our walk here. You very know, good point, Sean. Very good point. And just thinking about, yeah, thinking about their 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 reactions, but thinking back on why they drink, needed. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Thinking why they needed, why Yeshua uh, showed them this little piece of heavenly business. Yeah. Um, I think it's also to specifically communicate, I am Messiah, I was always Messiah before Abraham I am, just like what this other denomination that my brother just spoke of doesn't seem to believe, mm -hmm. um, is specifically done for them so that perhaps they don't get in their, to start to think in their minds that they have to go through the process of, 
exactly the same process of like going through the cross before they actually receive the, uh, you know what I mean? Like they're, so they don't equate his, his transformation uh, with becoming Messiah, which is I think what the Jews really always mm -hmm. believed. There's going to be once one amongst them, probably mm -hmm. amongst the priesthood, and mm -hmm. they're going to be anointed and they're going to become Messiah while being born among amongst them or among us and being well regarded forever by, you know, um, this is the antithesis of that. This is telling us, no, no, no. Messiah was set aside completely pure, sinless, you know, from immaculate conception to the cross and beyond. He was always full Messiah. So mm -hmm. don't make, don't make that mistake thinking he turned into one and he could have just been mm -hmm. a regular Joe. You know what I mean? See, it makes it may now that we've who are doing this have read the entire Bible, it makes sense, I feel, why they would think that though, why the Jews would think that. Because Moses was this normal ish guy. Yes. Right? And I'm not saying nothing bad. I'm just we're we're just talking about Moses good things. So we're <laughs> Moses is this normal guy ish, right? And then and then he does his thing and he goes and becomes a shepherd, but then God says the sentence, You are me on earth. Yeah. So they know that anything to do with Moses, Jews know, like anything, right? That's yes. one thing. They know that part of their Bible, right? Anything to do with Moses, anything to do with David. So the thing is, is like it would make sense that they would think what you're saying, Alex, because they would think that it would be somebody who would rise up, have some special gifting, memorizing scripture, quoting it like an autistic person, you know, perfect eyesight, saw it once, I never need to see it again, you know, that kind of thing. And then God anoints them and then God blesses them and then God goes before them and then God speaks that, that you know, you are me on earth. And then and the fact that he reigns for a thousand years, there's a finite to that. Even though a thousand years is a long time, it's still a finite thing. And, and we, we have Book of Revelations and we have then we have Daniel with Book of Revelations and Matthew and, and you know, Corinthians and stuff like that that tells us that there is like an end to the world. Daniel's not so clear that there's an end to the world. In fact, it goes straight from like second temple into, you know, basically Ezekiel temple. It's hard to know even which temple, what era, what time period, who's doing what and when, right? It's, it's hard for us. And we have the ability to hindsight and read it in scripture. So I'm just saying for anybody who's watching EBRT and you've been going along, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the culture and, and who these people were and what they thought. And I think it's, I, I'm, I'm super glad that we're having this conversation about how this whole thing about the manifestation, the transfiguration and all that, and nobody here will die until they see the power of God coming and why the Jews were looking for a guy who rode in on a horse and just killed Romans. Like, it just makes sense because they were thinking Moses. Yeah. They were thinking he's, Moses, the first they were thinking he's, David. He's the first Messiah. Yeah, David, yes. yeah. So it just makes sense. The anointing was put upon they, them. They, so, yeah. they basically believe Messiah is like a super prophet. Mm -hmm, exactly. He's a super prophet. O Omega. Omega prophet. Omega prophet. <laughs> yes. Um, and the Lord obviously has been prophesying from the first chapters of the Bible, who Messiah was going to be and what that was going to be like. Um, yeah. But they didn't necessarily, you know, it was hard. It was hard to see at their time of need. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. And then I think more people are talking about the tabernacle. So let's read that. Um, go ahead. Karen Dell Cunningham. Was oh, it my turn to read? Yeah. <clears throat> Karen Dahan Cunningham, Mark 9, 5 through 6. Peter responded and said to Yeshua, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Is it good for us to be here? Let us make three uh, sacred tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And for he did not really know what to say because he was terrified and stunned by the miraculous sight. How many times do we, like Peter, not know, not, not know what to say or how to respond when God shows us something amazing? But we go ahead and say something anyway. When we are really fearful and terrified, silence was probably most appropriate in that moment. That, But that religious tendency of the flesh to offer our works or doings 
shows up here and perhaps in Peter response rather than being still and knowing that he is God and in the end seeing Yeshua only, I am seeing my need for the Lord to help me to recognize this tendency of my flesh to speak out of anxiety and fear and offer a religious response to the mysteries of Yahweh. I felt some amusement reading Peter's response as I saw it in the religious nature of my flesh nature. Yikes. Also, I'm wondering if there is some connection to be made between the account of Moses' experience on Mount Sinai, Exodus 24, and the Transfiguration account here. Cool. So see, there's, there's people tying that together. There you go. Good stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, does it speak to basically Peter's, you know, remembrance maybe of what the Torah talked about and how a tabernacle was built for God and he resided in it. And so that being sort of the, the holiest thing that Peter could come up with at the moment um, but it's true. I see what you're saying, Karen, because he kind of immediately tries to busy, you know, busy himself with offering a service and and showing that he's reverent. Not 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 making fun of Peter or saying there's anything wrong with that. I I find it yeah. to be kind of well, what's the word? I don't want to say adorable, but you know what I'm saying. It's it's, Honor, it's honorable of him. Yeah, he he he. It's. It's it's almost it's innocent in its offering, but at the same time completely unnecessary, right? So, um, mm -hmm. and it also tells you that indeed, this thing really did happen. Because why that detail? <laughs> why the detail that? Oh, a bleat, a bleat, a bleat. I'm gonna build you a hut, and one for yeah. you. And one for Elijah and one for Moses. You're all going to have a hut. Right. I'll build it right now. Like, okay, if they made that up, it would be the last thing that Peter speaks. You wanted to, yeah. <laughs> why, would he, why, would he enter, why would he inject that into the yeah, storyline? Exactly. It was a made-up story. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. then I didn't know what to say. So I was just like, let's make some tests here, guys. What do you think? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, um, and I felt foolish, and then God kind of said a thing to us, and hey, shut up, listen, this is my guy, pay attention to him. So, yeah, yeah it just doesn't make sense why he would tell that story and lie about that part, you know? Yeah, like it's too, it's too weird, too kind of off the wall for that to be a lie. Yeah. Lies are always crafted to sound plausible, important, and to fit a theme, and to fit a narrative, to tell a story. Or, and this or to is, make you look good, too. <laughs> yeah, make things look good or something. They could have said Peter broke out in oh gosh, they could have said a thousand things, right? To make things oh, like seem, that. you know, kind of wooey wooey, but he's like, oh, uh, ten? <laughs> God, bless <laughs> Peter. God bless Peter. <laughs> Not making fun of Peter because God knows what would have come out of my mouth. Probably something like, you know, so you guys want to go get some In and Out Burger or something stupid? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Anybody want a, anybody want a burger? You yeah. guys are hanging out? Are you staying overnight? You guys <laughs> exactly. want me to cook something up? Exactly. Yeah. You want a euro? I get lamb euro. <laughs> euro? Oh, we're up right now. John, go go get a lamb quick. Oh, like that. My Those would be my thoughts. At least at least Peter was thinking along the lines of something biblical and thinking about tabernacles. Um <laughs> Oh goodness yeah. gracious! There's a there's a good live comment too. Folks are talking about live, so for those uh, those who are watching this record, I'll bring it. I'll bring you up to speed. There's a conversation of the law couldn't. This is uh, Linda Eli. She says, uh, "Oh wait," she replies to somebody else. Uh, uh, Jennifer Conley. Moses didn't get to go to the promised land, but Yahushua uh, Joshua uh, did, and his name means Yehovah Yeho is salvation. Um, uh, Ricardo says yes Joshua was a military leader and then Linnea says the law couldn't get them or us into the promised land but Joshua, Yeshua could, both names meaning salvation exactly, Jeffrey Conley says we always want to put God in a tabernacle don't we though, it's kind of weird us humans huh, Ricardo says uh, Yehoshua means the same as Yeshua Yahweh is salvation because Yeshua is the short form of Yehoshua. Yep. For just salvation, the Hebrew word 
is Yeshua. Strong's H3444. Yeah. So anybody who's watching this recording, I wanted to just bring you guys into that. Um, That was, wow, that was a very profound comment, Jennifer. And I remember us talking about that now during when we were still reading the Old Testament. And we talked mm -hmm. about how much they needed him to be housed in a place. And that's interesting because that feels suddenly relevant. Yeah, what did the human in his flesh walking around seeing the glory of Yeshua, the, the greatest of the prophets, God in the cloud telling them, this is my son, I'm well pleased. What is the first thing he came up with? Let's stuff it in a tent. Not that he was being meant anything bad by it. Not that he was trying to be whatever. I'm not making any kind of judgment. I'm just saying interesting. Is not is that maybe a reflection of our psychology? Is God maybe mm. showing us through scripture that, that this is what you, this is what it's always been. I've always been here available for this and and for the Moses of the world and for the Elijahs of the world. I, I was, I've always been here. And and all you've really kind of could think of was, can, can we put you in a building? A building, yeah. So that that could be most holy and so it so is god really telling us in scripture here is you know that whole temple idea where i was in a building i told you to put me there right but i did it because that's what you want it is yeah, actually your you impulse it. it is your impulse yeah. to put me in a building so i already knew you wanted that so i gave you that yeah. and and is that is that what's being you know possibly being communicated here that's actually very deep jennifer very very deep yeah, the other thing is, too, is like, you know, Karen, you'd called it a religious response. And I got it. It's funny because I've never, I've never put those two things together. I never, I, I don't, I just, ne I just don't think of it like a religious response, but you're totally right. In, in a Jewish sense, it, 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 I could see it as a religious response. The other thing is, is, is he's saying, can we build these three tents here to honor you, right? So even even if they're not saying, let's put your spirits in these tents and lock you up, even, even if right. they're not saying that, but he's saying, but he's saying, let's let's build a, like a memorial to the three of you on this mountain where you have met and seen each other, right? Like where this is this is transpired. Let's, you know, this. I think what it is too is Peter is witnessing an absolutely miraculous holy thing. Like he's seeing what holiness looks like. He's seeing their hero of heroes, which is Moses, and then probably their second hero of heroes, even you know, spiritually speaking, which is Elijah. And then he has Messiah with him, who's like glowing. It like, I mean, I could see how he would want to commiserate is that the word i'm looking for that the moment you know commemorate. what i mean like really commemorate commemorate thank you commemorate and it seen rusty yeah. gears guys they're in there somewhere so <laughs> you know it's uh i could see why he would want to do that and and i would agree with karen del Cunningham who said she sees the religious side of it and and uh that's interesting because like you're right it, that is a religious we want something we can pilgrim to do a pilgrimage to remember to see it you know things like that is this I've never had these thoughts about these scriptures and I just love, I love what's being mentioned here right now. Um, should we continue on? You got anything else? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, this is all really great. And, and, uh, for he wist not what to say for they were sore afraid. Oh, we're and frozen. It, we're frozen. Are we frozen for you guys? Or is it just at my place? Let me see. Sorry guys. I don't mean to interrupt, but. We're frozen. I want to know. Nope. We're okay. Not frozen. We're good. We're good. Just me. Just my internet. All right. Okay. okay cool. Good. All right. Um. Anyway, yeah. Just real quick, I was gonna say that you know. Uh, yeah. It, it's uh, it says, Peter answered and said to Yeshua, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make the tabernacles. For he was he for he didn't know what to say. For they were very afraid. Um, yeah, I do believe it's, it feels like they were witnessing something and they were just completely mind melted, mind melted and terrified and needed something to grab onto that was still resembling their world. 
let's do something. Let's build a tabernacle. Let's do something so we can we we we're just here witnessing this and it's driving us batty. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? All kinds of things that it, it makes sense. Um, well, the, it, on that because I think I mean what you said too is that like you, you know if you see the world around you literally rip like the ribbons of reality are ripped away, right? right. You might want to pick up a rock <laughs> just to like touch something that you feel is real. Like, am I awake? Am, I need to be like, I need to be tangible here. So, you know, the building of a thing, you're right. It might be the subconscious part of the mind wanting to, to go back to reality that they know yeah. it as then. But on top of that, that could also be fed by the fact that they probably felt extremely unworthy to be there. Right. I yeah. mean, you got Moshe and you got Elijah and you got Yeshua. It's like, what are we doing here? Right. And like, I'm, I'm fairly confident, you know, I would say that I get the vibe that Peter doesn't think of himself as in the same league worthy of being oh, yeah. amongst, you know, Mo- Moses and stuff. So it's like, you know, he's probably thinking like, I got to, I, obviously I'm not, I, I don't want them to think like we're here to hang out, like we're equals. Like I don't want Moses to look across the, the, the thresh here and go, oh, you guys are like us? Like you're like me and Elijah over here? And he's like, no, nah. like obviously we're the guys who will probably build a monument for you or something. Like he's probably trying to figure out what his Correct. place is yes. in that moment, right? Yeah. And so, he, and it says he doesn't know what to say. And I imagine the thing that most of us would be thinking is, is what am I supposed to do in this situation? Right. Like, and and I am actually seeing Moses. I'm actually seeing Elijah. Like, like you said, it, as far as he knows, the whole fabric of reality just got ripped to shreds, right? And he's just like, what? A, like, I don't want to make a mistake on this, and I don't want anybody to think that I think I deserve to be here. I should probably say something humble because the other thing is, is it says they like they like fell on their face and they're kind of freaked out. So I don't know. I, that's I'm just putting two and two together as well. I, I think I would do the same. I would think I would do the kind of kind of the same thing where I'm like, oh, I'm freaking out. Say something dumb. Put your face on the ground. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, pretty yeah. sure that's around where I'd be. Yeah. So it makes sense in that regard too. And they also don't have exactly. They don't they don't have the scriptures. No. To give them no, any exactly. context of what's happening. This is the experience that grows their faith. This is the experience that will later inform them and let them know that they were with, they were with Jehovah in flesh the whole time. There's, there's, they, they don't, they don't, get, they don't get scriptures like we do, where we can read and the Lord allows us to see that way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. So this is actually for them specifically as well, and yeah, like the context of it all is whatever they know from Jewish life, from, from his, you know, from uh, and the the, stories they know and the stories they know. So they're like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So he's pulling from there, from that, for that concept. Yeah. Brenda says live, we always want to have an answer to what to do. I mean, that is like so true. True. I, yeah. I think, I think in ministry, one of, one of the top five, email requests I get is, you know, people writing me saying, Hey, do you have any tricks on how I can hear from God? I really need to hear from God. I need to know what to do. Uh, so that that's another really important thing that you're pointing out there. Uh, Brenda is that, yeah, you're right. We have this human desire to not be in a limbo of unknown. Like at least tell me what I'm supposed to do. Just give me a task. So at least I know I'm not, I, I'm, I'm going to have a less chance of breaking something. <laughs> if you go put this in my hands and then tell me to carry it over there, then I know, okay, I'm good. So yeah, it, I think that's a really important thing you pointed out. I'm glad that got brought up. Thank you. Deborah says, I'm here, but not saying much. Pretty sick with upper respiratory infection. Well, in Yeshua's name, may you be healed right now in Yeshua's name, Deborah. Mm-hmm. We look forward to hearing a test- testimony for you. Sorry you're feeling sick. I was having a cough since last Wednesday myself, so that's why I'm drinking my tea. Mm. All right. You guys are funny. I love it. So Cameron Peterson, right? Mark 9, 12. Yeah. Uh, Cameron Peterson, yeah. Or 
I'm just reading live yes. comments. Yes, yeah. Cameron you Peterson. Mean... Okay. It is. Cam Cameron Peterson, Mark 9, 12 and 13. And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. I'm going to ask a bunch of questions, so buckle up. Excellent. This part got this part got Sarah and I talking about literal prophecy fulfillment. The more I read the Bible, the more I lean towards literal fulfillment of all prophecy. I am with you on that one. Okay. The prophecy yep. that I've read into which... The prophecy that I've read into which has already come to pass tends to be real, not figurative, and is typically clearly identifiable once the fulfillment has occurred. Yeshua seems to confirm here that John the Baptist was Elijah. He didn't just represent Elijah. So reading this passage let, led me to a few questions for y'all. Do you agree John the Baptist was Elijah literally? If so, could Elijah come again just before the second coming? Maybe to announce it. Uh, the verse here says the restoration of all things as opposed to Elijah preparing the way for the Lord, like John the Baptist. Uh, they could be the same, but I'm not sure. What do you think? Um, should I continue with the comment or should we answer this question first? Or talk the about verse this says first? the restoration of all things as opposed to Elijah preparing the way of the Lord. It's kind of the same language. Um, Let's I'll keep, just I'll just finish your comment. Let's keep we'll, reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this just <clears throat> makes me think of the end and how there will likely be an announcement of the coming, like we read in the parable of the ten virgins, and about knowing the season. It also makes me think of remnant theology, which discusses how God gives an announcement to the faithful, uh, for example, Noah and his family, uh, the people in Elijah's time when he when he's distressed on the mountain, fleeing Jezebel, etc so that they might be kept or saved from the consuming or from the coming destruction the parallel the parallelism that word is really hard to say the mm -hmm. parallelism in the bible is so heavy and it just seems to ring true here i keep feeling a connection between the flood yeshua's life and the end but i feel like god has only just begun to reveal these things to me does does mark 9 support this I don't want to go too far out on a tangent, but that's what the scripture brought to my mind. And I don't want to hold, hold back a comment just because I think it's too meandering or inconsequential. I hope this makes some sense at least. Well, first of all, thank you, Cameron, for not holding back. It is not meandering nor inconsequential. I think it's a very good question. It's very central to, I mean, I certainly have pondered this myself a lot. I know a lot of us have. Um... So, yeah, when you talk about par parallelism, uh, I think there's a ton of it in the Bible. Uh, we've, ta we've talked about it. We've seen it uh, throughout Scripture. So, yes, uh, one prophecy could be fulfilled three different times, or rather, three different things could very much have the same way of going. Um, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, as said Solomon, um, a lot of the uh, Antichrist story that we read in Revelation and in Daniel and other prophets sound like the Greek guy, whatever his name is, I forgot, and, and during Hanukkah time uh, when he was defeated by the Maccabees. Um, and yet that is not obviously the Antichrist, Antichrist. Um, but it is parallelism. Uh, so I'm on board with you about parallelism. As far as was John the Baptist Elijah literally? I'll let I'll let Nathan I'll let you speak, Nathan, in just a second. I'm just gonna get it out and then your turn. <laughs> I'm not in a rush. No, no okay. I, just, uh, I, I got, I, it sounded almost <clears throat> like a time. monologue. We're it only doing one like, chapter tonight. Yeah, it sounded almost like a monologue. I didn't mean to sound that way. But I guess what I wanted to say about Elijah being literally John the Baptist, I don't see why that couldn't be the case, um, especially since we were reading about how, um, uh, how the kingdom of God come with power, the beginning of this chapter, is talking about 
I think we're all kind of in agreement is this talking about Pentecost. And if that's the case, uh, and the prophecy is Elijah comes before the kingdom of God arrives, that would be exactly what happens. And in fact, when Yeshua does come, he comes and says, the kingdom of God is at hand. So I feel like Elijah being actually being John the Baptist makes sense to me. Is he, uh, does he know, just does John the Baptist know he's Elijah? Like in the fullest, fullest of senses? That's a mystery, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did know that, because he certainly knows who Yeshua is, and he's like the only one on earth that does. So, yeah. Now, is it, is it fair for him to be Elijah? In some ways it is, because Elijah didn't have to die. He was, he was so afraid of dying, and I'm not judging him, by the way, God forbid. Aren't we all afraid of dying? Um, but it seems to me that he was taken uh, uh, without dying, but then he got to, he had to go through it again, through life again, this time with some advanced knowledge of what his actual job was, was going to be to, you know, pave the way for Yeshua. And, uh, and he does die in the end, which perhaps he didn't expect. So he didn't know how his life was going to turn out, but he certainly was on a mission that I don't think anybody can argue was the most direct and unglorified mission a prophet has ever had. Like, he doesn't go up in front of kings and say, the Lord says, let my people go, or the Lord says, uh, stop worshiping Baal, and then fire comes from the sky and burns stuff, and he's like somewhat elevated in front of the people. No, he gets to eat mm -hmm. bugs, live in the desert, and <laughs> just just make people dip in the water and talk about somebody much greater than him coming. So that's about as like, that's kind of a humble, let's face it, that's a pretty humble prophet. Pretty humble. You know? Um, but at the same time, he always had the knowledge, I imagine, he always had the knowledge that he's paving the way for Messiah, and he knew who Messiah was, and he knew the family of Messiah, and he knew a lot of things nobody else did. And... Uh, yeah, so did he know he was Elijah? I think maybe it's possible. I just don't think he knew that how it was all going to end for him as John the Baptist. That part I feel he didn't know. Um, so anyway, that's my two cents. I hope that wasn't too long. No. <clears throat> I'm in agreement with with uh, uh, with you. I, I think... <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think, I don't think he knew he, he was if you will, and I, I hate to use this word because it will open a can of, of, of worms, if you will. I hate the same, but it, like, I think he, I think this is probably like the one ish, obviously reincarnated moment in the Bible, right? Like he says it is coming, he's come again, right? So, or resurrected or whatever you want to call it. But like, I think that, that as far as he knows that I think John the Baptist came in his, in the spirit of Elijah, but I don't think he knew like he was the rebirthing of Elijah. And I do think he was the rebirthing of Elijah because of how Yeshua says it. And I think, cause there's some live comments right now, Linda Eli says in John gospel, John one, six, it says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So it, John, the apostle is saying that God sent john the baptist to do that specific role yeshua constantly is saying elijah has come you know john the baptist he's come he is right uh, surely i say elijah has come already so he he tells us he, he, like john the baptist is it so the other thing that i just thought is interesting as well is is this event is after john the baptist dies john the baptist is dead at this point Right. So it's not like a duality thing either. There's not like two J Elijah spirits on earth at that time. So am I right I, or no? I think you're right, but I don't remember because we, we read Matthew and certainly he dies in, you know, at some point in Matthew. I don't remember if it was before or after the transfiguration. Yeah. If, if it is, if it is that he, he, he died before this happened, I think it only makes more sense. If it doesn't, then it also goes to show you how there might be some type of spiritual separation between John the Baptist oh, no, and Elijah. Oh, no, no, it happened before, Mark 6. 
Okay, so there you go. There so, you go. Um, so I think that is interesting. I, I don't know. I, I, I think that that maybe that event had to happen first before this this happened. So, um, yeah. Uh, the, now, Christina Live says in John one twenty one, John the Baptist said he is not Elijah. So, and that's where I I get the idea that he doesn't know. Like that, I don't want to say his soul is Elijah because I don't understand. I don't think anybody fully understands what's going on with this Elijah and John the Baptist thing and how they're one but different. But I'm under the impression that he doesn't have a remembrance of being uh, Elijah. Like, I don't think it's like, you know, God was like, you're going to go back. And then he's like a baby in the womb. And he's like, I'm in a baby body. Like, I don't think it's adult brain consciousness, awareness, Elijah in a baby body. And then he grows up in the body. But like, I think we think like that might be what it is like movie style. Like this is an avatar and like yeah. he's in this body. That's just an avatar for Elijah. I think it was a whole new go at it <clears throat> with a specific, very humble ministry as, as Alex pointed out. And it's really, really, really hard to throw away the fact that he died exactly how Elijah was scared to die. Right. It's the exact same death. A woman is after him, doesn't like him, wants his head on a platter, right? And and then he, he even tells his apostles, go tell my cousin, like, I'm booked. They got me, you know, he'll get me out. And then he doesn't, you know, and it's like Yeshua saying, this is, listen, you got, you got, like, you got out of it the first time, but you're not going to get out of it this time. Sorry, bud. It's like, it's, it's pretty rough. It's, I'm not making fun. It's a pretty rough situation, right? As John the Apostle, right? Or John the Baptist, excuse me. It's a pretty rough situation. So, yeah, I, I don't think he knew or he fully believed. But what if also <clears throat> in the new brain, new existence is of John the Baptist, he was, humble enough to go think to himself there's no way that i could be elijah like he's thinking himself elijah is too great and i am i am not worthy of that i mean here he is saying i'm not worthy to tie the shoelaces granted a messiah but i'm not worthy to tie the, the shoelaces uh or take off the shoes the sandal straps of messiah i just think that he's he's a humble man so he wouldn't have been like dang right i'm elijah 2.0 come back shoot y'all better recognize i don't i just don't i just don't see john the baptist stepping in that so yeah. So it just seems like a, it's, it, they're way too close in. And the fact that Yeshua says it, it's whether we understand it and how it works out, I, I'm in agreement with my own statement here. I have no idea. I don't think any of us can know. So uh, I think that's also the wonderful thing about the Lord. We, we're, we're never going to know these things until uh, we get there. Ricardo, Go ahead, Mike. I remember, I remember reading ahead, reading Luke and being so thankful for Luke because a lot of these kinds of little moments and mysteries. Uh, are addressed in Luke, and uh, and here Luke one seventeen, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So I think what Ricardo is telling us here is he goes in the spirit and power of Elijah in the same anointing that Elijah got, and I guess in the same anointing that Elisha got. John the Baptist received. Um, mm. So when when the prophecies talk about Elijah coming first, are they saying Elijah the spirit, Elijah the man, Elijah or the soul? Eli yes, exactly. Elijah the anointing that was given to Elijah, which was then given to Elisha, double portion, right? Right. Um, is so, yeah. So. Um. That does make sense um, yeah. in that way. So I guess the answer would be, uh, Cameron, put it in your pocket, read ahead, re read ahead later, and then here it is in Luke, somewhat explained. Um, and true, what uh, others are saying here, that in John uh, one twenty one, uh, John the Baptist uh, very clearly states, no, I am not Elijah, uh, mm -hmm. and no, I'm not the Messiah. Um, so I guess then that makes it possible for the spirit and power of Elijah has come before Yeshua's first coming. And I guess it's possible that Elijah himself, um, makes an appearance 
perhaps before his second coming, like you're saying, is it possible that he's going to come again? And the answer is, I guess it's possible. We don't. I. I. Mm. I, I certainly don't know, but I think it's possible. Um. Because if Elijah wasn't physically John the Baptist, if they're not the same, the John the Baptist right. simply came in his stead and in his power and in his anointing. Yeah. That means right. there are two people in the Bible that didn't die. Elijah and Enoch. Right. And I remember... Which are um, the two most decided people right. to be the two witnesses. Yeah, yeah two witnesses. Yeah. Hmm. I, yeah. The thing that confuses me is the sentence where Yeshua says, I, I tell you that he has already come. That's that's the sentence that, that stumbles me up because I'm like, well, so he's saying he already came. So then he doesn't need to come again. I know it's in the spirit of like, I get that part. So does therefore he's saying, I tell you that that is so roll with me guys sorry i'm gonna be super like lame in here in regards to the prophecy of elijah he's saying hey everybody just know that prophecy has been fulfilled he has already come he's speaking directly to that prophecy right like to elijah ness right he's saying i am saying that this is a done deal i am saying it's enough I'm saying that his spirit being upon John the Baptist and the anointing being upon John the Baptist is, is prophecy fulfilled. And because he says it is so, it is so. But does that not mean that the soul or the being of Elijah does not come later as one of the witnesses, right? So I, I think like that to me is where, that, that to me is, is the way that I guess my brain is currently in this conversation working those two things that seem kind of uh mixed up you know working a, that out i have a i hope i can communicate this well but i have this like notion that there are prophecies that have as as uh as uh you mentioned cameron have parallelism and the prophecies in the old testament of the end times and of the millennial and of the uh the kingdom of the lord obviously state things in such a way as to be completely vague about oh it's actually the second coming of a guy named yeshua and like it doesn't give you those details right but all of those prophecies um are pointing to that final resolution um then there's the then yeshua comes it's not yet the final resolution but it is the start of god's kingdom on earth and it's designed specifically to uh, go outside of Israel and now to include the Gentiles. And so the Jewish prophecies that are in the Old Testament about the end times and about Elijah coming are true. And Yeshua, for the sake of recruiting, I'm using the words recruiting, you know, just recruiting is a bad word, but Yeshua, for the sake, uh, for the sake of those that witness him, who he's going to make into apostles and disciples, they need to act there. They've been told that before Messiah shows up, Elijah shows up. So if somebody shows up and they claim to be Messiah, you got to ask him, where's Elijah then, bro? So he has to, he need, he's telling them that Elijah did already come, but it doesn't cancel. It doesn't complete and cancel the prophecies given on to the Old Testament guys about the end when Elijah comes too. So. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It does, but there's no way for us to know it. I'm not trying to disagree with you. I'm just saying I, it makes sense what you're saying, and that's what I was saying too, is like, could that be? But I, I don't think that I, – I, again, I'm, I'm saying this just as an inclusion of all of us. Like, I, I, I'm, I maybe will keep reading, or maybe somebody has information that it still needs to be brought up in the conversation, but I, I'm under the persuasion that we can't stand so bold as to really understand – what this whole John the Baptist Elijah witness thing is. I it's awesome though is there's a very good chance that somebody watching this video right now will know one day. <laughs> somebody somebody watching this video, live or recorded, will actually know the answer to what we are sitting here on this day in 2023, going, 
what, how, what, how will this all work out? Who will the witnesses be? There could be somebody watching this video in the future going, those silly people doing EBRT in 2023. It was obviously, blah, blah, because there he is. You know what I mean? Or there they are. Right. So it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool to think that. Uh, real quick, Ricardo says, it's more clear when you include the conversation with Gabriel and Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist in Luke 1, 11, 17. So let's yeah. read that real quick. Well, that's what I Luke, read, Luke 1, 1, 17. Oh, you just read it out loud? Yeah. Did I miss yeah. it? Oh, well, my yeah, bad. That was, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, got you. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and Tracy Parker says, I believe it's one of those God can do what he wants things. <laughs> I'm in agreement with that one for sure. Reminder, when Yeshua transfigures John, yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm just going back here. Damar Liv Martin. There's a man on TikTok that says he is one of the witnesses. If I had a dollar for every time I've been contacted by supposedly one of the witnesses, it is a lot. Wow. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, hallelujah. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Praise the Lord. All right. Where are we? Mara Jolin Rice heals the boy. Yeah. Okay. I'm 14. Jolin Rice. I like how the father of the boy with the demon when told to just believe, asked Yeshua to help him with his unbelief and believe for him. This whole interaction seems so important to me, believing. It seems so simple, yet sometimes so hard. But what if we, but what if all we have to do is ask Yeshua to believe for us and we are the ones making it hard? That is a really good suggestion. That is a really good suggestion. What if we just allowed Yeshua to believe for us? Yeah. That is a really good question. I think that's the right one. Uh, let's see. Huh. Very deep stuff. I agree with you, Deborah. Sorry, just reading some live comments here. Interesting. I think there's a delay in my uh, comments, guys. So if you guys are leaving comments, I haven't seen all of them. Something's been up <clears throat> with my with my feed tonight. So. Yeah. Something wrong with my feed. All right. Well, we'll continue on until my feed catches up. Okay. How's that? Um, uh, yes. Um, Yeshua believes for us is where we were. I agree. I, you know, I, I like that. I think I'm going to start praying that more. Hey, Lord, can you believe for me on this? Because my face sucks right now. <laughs> can you, yeah. can you, that's a very good prayer. You ask amiss, right? What if that's the right, the rightest of all prayers is to ask him for help in the thing that we, in the key to it all, which is our lack of belief. Wow, it's deep. Actually, yeah. honestly, I I do remember that prayer has a lot of power. I have experienced it. Um, I have I have experienced it. Um, real quick testimony. I think it was a few months back. Um, uh, watching one of Nathan's videos about um, about, I think you ended the video with asking the Lord to give the faith. Yeah. To have the faith, so to speak. Ask the Lord to give you faith that one day you will have the faith that oh, you yes. want to have. And yeah. um, I, I did pray that. Uh, I was very tired. I did pray that. I went to sleep and then had an experience where I thought, absolutely, the Lord revealed something to me. And um, it was very powerful and very quick, that whole transaction, if you will. So, mm. uh, and here we have scriptural example of that exact thing 
So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's funny because, you know, I you I, the way I usually word it when I get into those moments is I say, you know, Lord, I ask you to send the Holy Spirit to intercede because there's passages about the Holy Spirit interceding for us because we ask amiss and, you know, but I know they're one and the same, but I like the idea of, of saying Yeshua believe for us, believe for me. I like that idea. Like, that's a good prayer. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to incorporate that. I just like it. It's, I, I like also saying, you know, the Holy Spirit, Lord, send the Holy Spirit to intercede and intervene. And, you know, anything that I don't, that I'm not praying right, or I'm praying amiss. If anybody's been to a meetup, you hear me pray this a lot, especially when we're praying for one another. Anything that we're praying for, then and that might be amiss. May the Holy Spirit inter intercede and bring the the best prayer up to your ears. You know uh, that that it may be pleasing to you, and that your will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like the, this is the kind of way that I would say that. But it's it's funny because there's an intimacy that I think kind of, and, and maybe I'm the only one here. You guys might be different. But I know when, when people write me a lot, too, and they're like, I don't know who to pray to. Is it God? Is it Yeshua? Do I include the Holy Spirit? So my point that I'm trying to make here is, is that I, I feel very intimate for some reason with Yeshua. Not, you know, I feel like God, the Godhead, if you will, is like just my brain just begins to fry as soon as I try to even imagine what the Godhead is, what it would look like, you know, that he looked like, you know. Nobody freak out over the reason I use the word it. It's just a, it's, it's what my brain is trying to comprehend is in, impossible to envision. So, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit, which is the very spirit of God that lives in us, and technically that is the most intimate of the version of God we actually experience. That is the most intimate. That is the actual part we get to physically emotionally psychologically experience for most of us it's the holy spirit but when i feel my intimacy when i feel my love it usually is directed towards yeshua so the reason why i'm saying that is to say that when i say send the holy spirit lord you know to intercede and and and, and basically give the right prayer i'm kind of having faith that there's something i don't know but when I talk about when, when you write this, Jolin, uh, about Yeshua have the faith for me, it's like I can imagine Yeshua in his form sitting on the throne having faith for me. Like, I, it, it, you know, I think that that's why we have Messiah, by the way, because one of the things humans have always struggled with is how do I relate to this creator? <laughs> right. Like, why did God create these human forms or these images of himself throughout human history? It's because the human mind is like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I'm too dumb. I don't get it. What are you? Where are you? Can you go in that building over there? Like, can I put you in this tent? You know, it's like we, we're, we're just the brain melt is too much. And he knew that. So he's like, I'm going to make a you version. Right. Which also matches with the whole statement in the garden. You know, all that kind of stuff. And it's just like, so I love this. I, I think it's more intimate. And I think that intimacy with the Lord is super important. And I do think that there's a lot of us in the body of Christ that are missing, um, missing that. And I think that the closer you feel and the more of that, that, that really, I, I'm sure somebody watching this, I'm sorry if I sound like I'm ranting, but I think this will help some people in their walk. And especially, I know there's a lot of people dealing with depression right now. Some of you know, I just got through a very dark period myself. But one of the things that I, I sometimes allow myself to imagine, if you will, is me sitting on Yeshua's lap as like a child version of me. And he is just holding me in his arms like, like a father does to their kid when they're hurt or sad, like really sad or something like that. And even though I'm a full grown man now, I, I sometimes allow myself to have this vision because it allows me to understand my, my role. I am his child. He is my dad. He is my Abba. Right. And it really helps me fight off depression. It really helps me to to fight off the lies of the enemy, right? Oh, you're not worthy. He'll never love you. It's like, uh, what, what, what kid, young, especially kid that we, we have in our lives does something wrong. And we're like, that's it. I'm disowning you. I'm throwing you away to the birds. Go out on the street, you eight year old brat. Like, like you get what I'm saying? Like this, there's this threshold we have 
for the younger that were just like, <laughs> you're just being dumb, but I, I totally love you. You're an idiot right now, but I totally love you. And I just feel like I'm in a perpetual, you're an idiot. But God's like, I still love you. So, I, and I just feel that that's that intimacy. And I feel that that's a wonderful truth that the devil doesn't want us really to know. So I wanted to throw that out there and, and point out why I think, Joel, in what you're saying and, and why this conversation portion is is a good thing for all of us to remember. Amen. All right. Go ahead, Brian. No, I think that's a, that's a, um, I think that's beautiful. Um, and yeah. Oh, there uh, it is. Sorry, Romans eight twenty six is the passage. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but it, that's okay. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So yeah. that's what I evoke when I do those. The ending of my prayer like that—that's the promise, I guess you could say. Sorry, now go ahead, brother. No, I, I you think I think you bring up some, uh, you know. Yeshua is meant to be, he, he he really is the bridge, a bridge created for us, so we can approach yeah. the throne. Yeah, uh, amen. Because trying to approach the throne on your own, without an advocate, without a bridge, good luck. I mean, I've, <laughs> I every time I imagine the throne of God and me trying to talk to God and ask him for stuff, I turn into a ball of uh, wet wet noodles, you know, it's forget yeah. about it. I, I feel completely incapable of anything. Uh, yeah. to ask, to speak, to say, but I know that God is so loving that without me asking, he knows what the needs are. Yeah. And, and, um, it's good to talk to Yeshua because that, that is the point of him being Messiah. That is the yeah. whole point of him being sort of that, ex that being, being, <laughs> yeah. Being that being. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that is our bridge. And, um, Sometimes I like to, to my, I, I'm, I'm actually getting something out of this testimony from Nathan is sometimes I will pray and I will pray to the father because, mm -hmm. uh, I will pray to Jehovah himself because somewhere in my mind, maybe I think to, well, since Yeshua is just a bridge, I, you know, I, I know what it's a bridge to. So what he's a bridge to, so I'll just go direct to the word himself. And that may not be proper. Uh, in, in doing so, I might be saying to the bridge, I get it. Thanks. But I'm just going to talk to the man. Like, I know you're the same man. So let's just, I'll talk to the, the big guy, <laughs> whatever that, whatever that calculus is. I actually don't think it's right. And maybe that's why sometimes the prayers don't feel quite right. Um, or something, you know, uh, I know that when I have sought Yeshua earnestly in my heart, I received a lot. Uh, like mm -hmm. immediate, immediate calmness, immediate emotional things that I would need. And usually I would seek Yeshua out in my heart, specifically in the same way that my brother is describing where, okay, I'm screwed. I can't deal with this. Pardon my French. I can't deal with this feeling at all. This is, I cannot deal with this darkness coming at me. I need yeah. to sit. I need Yeshua. I just need you to come and give me a binky right now. I need you to yeah. make this go. I'm, I'm using childhood, childish language because of pacifier, for, pacifier for the foreigners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need you to come and I need you to totally like, I can't figure this one out. And, yeah. and, and I, 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 I testify completely. He does not let me go to bed, uh, you know, confused and hurting and, and broken and on fire when I come at him like that, when I realize yeah. I do need him, I do need the Messiah. Um, yeah. So that's the whole point. He even says, nobody comes to the Father except through me. And mm -hmm. and um, one of the reasons why it's hard to ask Yeshua for things that don't seem to involve a lot of sacrifice or suffering is because of what Yeshua suffered and sacrificed. So I feel shame asking him for things. I feel less shame maybe asking to the Father. But then, but then I, you know what I'm saying? It's this... I, I guess I'm just talking, trying to talk to all the confusion that we kind of go through uh, in this prayer business. And I want to say that maybe don't skip the bridge, even if the prayer is not worthy of the bridge, because the bridge is so awesome. Yeshua is so amazing and so giving and loving. And the prayers, <laughs> Lord, I, you know, whatever our little anxieties might be, considering what he went through, my mouth has a hard time moving towards asking for that stuff, but 
I, I'm going to try is what I'm saying. I'm going to try more to give Yeshua his proper place in the business of prayer. So that's that's a, that's my little conviction for. I mean, it's not the. I'm sure it's not the only conviction for tonight, but it is one. <laughs> so I love this conversation, and here's why. I know many people write me a lot about this specific thing, as as we've talked about. You know, who do I pray for? I don't know. I'm just confused. I feel like I need to pray to Yeshua. I, I you know, or I, you know, I, I feel like that's the one my go to. That's my go to. I pray to Yeshua. You know, that's the terminology I hear a lot. And so it's interesting is that you know Yeshua does tell us, pray to the Father in my name. It's a commandment He gives us. So I think that that's where, like, if you ever hear me pray, I, I usually say, Oh my Yehovah, I acknowledge the Father head, and I say, I come to you in the name of Yeshua Mashiach, right? And I do pray to the Father, and it is weird. Uh, I'll be honest. Like I, it, for me, I feel that too, Alex. And this is why I love this conversation. And Ricardo did point that out as well. That uh, he left it in the comments that yes, Yeshua did tell us to pray to the Father directly, but in His name. So this is a thing too that like we modern people don't understand this whole in His name stuff. We really don't. Uh, not uh, even I'm going to say you know you UK folks, you right? The, the British, the British Kingdom folks over there who have kings or anywhere else in the world where you guys still have kings or, or whatever emperors and stuff. It's like, at least here in America, I'm going to say, we don't have a, we really we're clueless when it comes to what it's like to have a king. So a president's totally different. It's like, that's our servant. We put him in there. He, he'll be out in four years, eight years. If we don't like him, it's very different than a king. Right? So my point is to say is that when we come to the father in Yeshua's name, when we ask the father in Yeshua's name, I guess the way that I, I heard this, and I don't know where I heard it, but I like it. So I'm just, I'm regurgitating this from somebody else. Now I'm, I'm putting that out there. I, I can't take credit for this. But what you're doing is, is you, you, you know that you are the filthy rags. You're this being that has sin. You, you have no place to stand before the Father, which is what my brother Alex and what I was saying in this video. But when you say, I'm not coming to you as me. I'm not coming to you, God as the person that I am and the, and the container and the things that I am and the things of this life that, that you know that I am, I would never dare. And this is like just psychological. I would never dare present that to you with requests of something of you, right? That's just not worthy. But I acknowledge what you God did with your lamb. And I acknowledge that lamb. And I acknowledge what that lamb did on that cross. And I acknowledge that that lamb rose again. And I acknowledge that that lamb held your spirit and that Yeshua is Yahweh saves. And Yeshua commanded me to come to you. And he has every right and authority for me. If he says I'm allowed to, then, then now I'm allowed to. And so the thing is, is that when we do come to the Lord, which is why this got brought up, I think, last video, why the name Yeshua, is, you know, or uh, two videos ago. So this is why I personally gravitated towards the name Yeshua the moment I heard it and why it was weird for me to continue to use Jesus amongst my brothers and sisters when I was in ministry was because when I say the name Yeshua, I am in my brain acknowledging its meaning Yahweh is salvation. So like there's this whole universal picture of Yahweh in Yeshua dying on the cross, resurrecting on the cross, ascending, you know, being all godliness, but in human form. And when Yeshua says to us, ask the father in my name, I know it's not just to say the words in his name. I ask blah, 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 blah. It's actually to stand in Yeshua's blood. It's actually to say, I am not coming to you on my accord. I'm coming to you in the spilled blood that, you know, is on me. Uh, this blood spilled onto me because Yeshua says I get to have it spilled onto me. And so you've opened a door, you've opened a portal, you've opened up some kind of, you know, telephone call that I can make to you because the blood of Christ is on me. And I'm using that. I'm, I'm, I'm utilizing that sacrifice Yeshua made for me. And when you really come at the father as your dad you know like i was saying about how i imagine like i'm in his arms and i'm a little kid version of me but like yeshua to me is dad 
He is the dad. And so when I come to him in the image, in my mind of Yeshua, he is saying, you acknowledge that I, your God, love you this much. And now the dad becomes approachable, both in my heart and in my mind. But as long as I keep the father figure in that cosmic, I can't figure out the whole entire galaxy and universes is in the palm of his hand, I can't come to the, the boldness to him because I have no idea what I'm coming to. There's nothing that my mind can reason. But when I acknowledge because he said, me and the father are one, when I, when I come in the name, I don't think of it as just I'm saying the name out loud. I think of it more as I'm coming in the essence of what you demonstrate who you are for me on the cross and in the resurrection. I acknowledge that that is my God that loves me that much. I acknowledge that you don't want me to be separated from you from my sin, but you're allowing me to recognize my sin and my sinful nature while at the same time you gave me a door to come to you. Right. Because I'm saying I'm not coming to you as Nathan Wheeler. I'm not coming in my own spirit. I'm not coming with the authority or the right that I have to stand before you, Lord, and ask and ask anything of you, even just to receive my love. But I acknowledge that you you did make a way and that way is the lamb. And I, and I am coming and I'm utilizing that. And that's good. That's what you wanted me to do. That's what you told me to do. So I'm doing it. And so it's more of like an authority. It's more like a relationship that I perceive. And and I, I know there would be some quicker way that somebody on YouTube made a meme in like a minute in a minute of saying that better than me. So maybe you can find it. But I, I that to me is like when that light bulb goes on, you know, that that to me is why the name Yeshua means so much to me personally is because I see him in, in, in Yeshua when I use that name. And that's and I've said that from the beginning. That's that's just my personal preference. I'm not saying it doesn't have power or nothing. So yeah. I hope that speaks to somebody but, too. By using Yeshua but, the name, using Yeshua well, the name is is the, the part of the that whole bridge testimony thing. You are testifying, and, and it bridges in your mind. Yeah, that it's that that when you when you when it you helps say, your belief. You could uh, even say it does help the belief. Like to, well, yes. it helps the belief for sure. To believe the words are for you. Right. It's yeah. one thing to read the Bible and then think, oh, that's great for everybody else. They all have this. They all everybody else on the planet has this. But me, I'm I'm not worried. Either. None of these promises in the Bible are for me. Right. But then when you look at Yeshua, when you look to the cross, like that's the thing is he says, come boldly to the to the feet of the cross, come boldly to the throne through Yeshua. Right. So you so that's the thing is like, I know I don't have the right. So I'm like evoking like well, i don't know there's a word for it like like when you you you, you know you're claiming you're, well there's like a there's like a i know there's some kind of international word like you're you're pulling out the card you know that you get to you know here's here i have a written thing from the king of blah blah, blah. i have a written thing i'm not worthy to be in the halls right now but the king has commanded me to be here and therefore i have this i have the ability to be here none of you can talk trash because you, you you can talk trash about me, but you can't talk trash about my claim that was yeah. given to me to be here. Do, do you get what I'm trying to say? Because if you right. deny the claim for me to be here, you're denying the king himself. So right. this is the part that I'm saying that we Americans specifically, I would say we don't really understand the power of that. That the, the, that a written note or a commandment of the king is the king himself. So you can't deny the king, which means that we can't deny if the king says, come before me but come through Yeshua and Yeshua says, nobody comes to the father except through me. That's because we, well, how, how can we understand it? How can we be right with it? Is God going to even hear it? Like we're not worthy to stand before him. It's like a trump card. Yeah. So, but there's a word for it. I can't remember what it is, but anyways, it's, it's really, yeah. I, I don't know if this is making sense. It's kind of a rant, but you guys. Well, uh, yes. I think it's making sense. I think, uh, um, I think what you're saying that if you hold the faith and the belief of everything promised by Yeshua and accept him completely in everything he said, one of the things that he very blatantly said is by being of me, by being a believer, you now have the way to the throne. And if you truly believe I'm Messiah, if you truly believe I died and rose and all the things you've read, if you believe those things, then you can stand on those things in front of the throne. If you can't stand in front of the throne, having heard this, 
that maybe means you don't fully believe or understand what you've been told or what you've been what you've read of what you've heard you know what i mean yeah i mean that's that, that's a really good way of wording it too if, if i may real quick so i love that yeshua when he he's standing in front of the, the sanhedrin on his judgment right in, in the middle of the night and he says what why are you beating me but what have i done and they're like you know this and that and he goes well if you don't believe my words look at my actions and 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 he's like those those speak those testify of me right and like so the thing is is that i, I have this there's, i don't know if anybody else is like this so i'm throwing it out there i don't have an issue uh as i don't there's i don't have an issue for some reason god it's all the holy spirit obviously of, of believing that yeshua lived died on the cross and rose again like that's something that my spirit doesn't struggle with my mind doesn't struggle with it right it's a thing I just feel like I've seen it. I feel like a part of me was there when it happened and I just believe it. So, but when I read the Bible and I start going through these promises that God has, I'm like, oh, well, he obviously wrote that for Ezekiel. Oh, well, he obviously wrote that for Samuel. Oh, he obviously wrote that for Daniel. Oh, he obviously blessed Solomon with the wisdom. You know, obviously look at how wise the guy ended up being, right? But that has nothing to do with me. That has nothing to do with me. So when I'm reading through the Bible, there's all these words that I'm like, oh, I, I mean, I believe he said that to that guy. I believe that he loves that girl. I believe that he loves these people. I believe that these are his children. That has nothing to do with me. So then, luckily for me, the thing I don't have a struggle with is what Yeshua did. And I don't have a struggle that he did that on the cross for me. And then Yeshua says, if you can't believe anything else, stand only in the cross. Stand only in what I did for you. Damn. like that's it that's all i need you know then i can come to the lord god and then i can go i don't get a lot of it i think 99 percent of it i'm just not even worthy to even remotely try to go oh I'll, I'll take some of that sprinkling of goodness and favor and you know protection and all i i just i can't but christ told me so i here i am you know and like that's it that's all i got sometimes Christ told me, so, so here I am. And I just think like, that's the point. You know, I think that that really is the point. I think like Christ knew that we couldn't really receive it all. And so he, he can, he can be that for us, which is why I love have the faith for me, Christ, Yeshua have a belief for me. And it's like, man, I think that, I think it's a revolutionary idea, though many of you may have already thought it. I'm just saying tonight, I'm getting a revolutionary idea that you know i can come and go yeshua i don't i don't perceive that a lot of this stuff will apply to me because i'm such dirty rags but like if you if you believe for me if, if you say it so i know it will be so and then you look at all the times you look at all the times peter says lord tell me to come out on the water and then you look at the times where, where yeshua is healing people and he goes do you believe i can do this and they're like yes and their faith is healed the woman grabs him. He turns around. Who touched me? And he says, by your faith, you've been healed. If The funny thing is, is she believed in the anointing on Yeshua because it's easier for us to believe that Yeshua is worthy of that anointing. And if we can just simply touch his anointing, if we can just simply brush up against the anointing that Yeshua most definitely deserves, then we might get a little bit of that blessing upon us. Right? And that's where the intimacy comes from. That's the intimacy. That exactly. is where the intimacy comes from. Because if Yeshua is that intimate to you, you know he's all powerful and can do everything. And uh, oh, I'm losing my train of thought. All I'm trying to say is like, it, if 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 you have if if your father is a wildly rich human being, and they have all the power in the world to get you whatever trinket. Uh, um, um, to get you whatever you need, forgive trinket, forgive, get you whatever you need. Um, and they have all the knowledge and they have all the power. You know that all you need to do is, is to go ask them. You wouldn't think twice. You wouldn't think twice. You would immediately go ask them for what you need because they can get it for you. And since they're your father and they love you, they will do it. Right. You know, of course, if it's not evil or something awful, but if it's something yeah. you need and something good, they will do it. And so yeah. it's the same kind, and that kind of intimacy, you don't, you don't doubt, you don't doubt that the father will do it for you, assuming you're asking well, and you're a good, a good child. 
Um, so I guess that's where the intimacy comes from, is that if you believe that he has the power to do all the things that you need done, all you have to do is believe that and come ask him intimately. Like you so would. So I like... Go ahead. No, no, go. Like, 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 like you would a father who has the power to do all the things you need done. You trust him. So, you trust him like a father, like you would trust a father. Who are you talking about? The father head, or are you talking about Yeshua? Uh, I'm talking about Yeshua, but um, but it's okay. But it's all part of it's Yeshua. It's all one. Same. It's all one. Yeah. So we we get that yeah. here. Thank God. But so on that, I want to say is that 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 for me is my mental struggle. Again, I don't know if anybody else has this, but that's my mental struggle. Like if I go to the father. There's a part of me that's like, I can't ask for this. Like, I can't ask you for this. You've already given me too much. You've already given me so much. I can't ask you for this. And it might be something that I feel I need, but I'm like, I can't ask you for this. Like, I just can't do it. And then, but then I could be like, but if I knew, if I knew that Yeshua went to the father and said, I'd like Nathan to have this, or I'd like you to help Nathan here. Do I think that the father would deny him, deny his request? in spite of me? And the answer is no. I think that Yeshua's anointing and sacrifice on the cross and all that he did, and as the Lord said, this is my son in which I'm well pleased. See, that this is where like, it's like a, I don't know. And I know this is kind of Christianity 101 that we're talking about here, right? But does it ever really go away? Like, I don't think so, because we're talking about an unfathomable, un mis impossible to fully understand thing. But I can't come to the father and go, I'd like this, but I know that if Yeshua asked the father for me, it would be granted onto me because of the goodness and the wholesomeness and the righteousness and, and the love of Yeshua, not because of me. And so I guess that's the thing is I can't, I mean, personally, I can't come to the father boldly. I can't, like, I just can't. So, but if I can come to Yeshua and I can say, you know, Will you ask the Father's will to be done? I know it's one and the same. I know this is that whole thing that we all get into. But like, if I can say, you know, this part of you, you Lord God, <laughs> this this is part of you that died on the cross and rose again, I, I am I am petitioning to this part of you <laughs> and saying, you know, you pray it because then I know if that if you prayed it, it, it's because it is in your will, and then I'll, I'll know. And not like I can possibly hear in heaven what's being said, whatever, right? But I guess it's just the conceptual of it. it it's like, I, it, it's a weird thing, this whole thing. I hope I'm making sense. Um, I, I have I have more of the feel like, I guess because of the way that Yeshua interacts with so many people in the Bible, you know, from the prostitutes to the tax collectors to the, you know, to everybody who fumbles and stumbles and people who aren't even Jewish and he's blessing them and healing them to the woman who's like, I'm a dog, give me the crumbs. You know what I mean? Like, I think that, yeah, Lord, I'm a, I'm a dog. Give me the crumbs, you know, but, but you got to come and you got to just be like, like, I'll ask Yeshua for the crumbs, but what, okay, here's the analogy and I'm done. I would never dare enter into the Holy of Holies in the Jerusalem temple, <laughs> right? Pull back the curtain, lock in and be like, I'm going to live through this request. Hey, give me the ephod. Hey, give me the Uman Thurman. I'm going to ask God a question for myself. Just want to happen. Like that's not going to happen. Right. Because I just know I die. I need some bells on me because I die. So but what if I saw Yeshua walking in the street, would I run up to him and would I ask him? Yeah, I beg him. You see my point? So like that's the point of Yeshua is that that he is that he is that for us. He makes it so that we can come to him who is the father, that we can come and make that petition, that request and and you know even if he turns around which he says and i know we're going to get to more passages here we got to keep going but he even says how long will i be with this generation like he's saying gosh you guys again again when you when is this going to stop with you guys like how many of you are sick like he gets frustrated but i i think that's again just a blessing for our humanity to know that uh when we get frustrated it doesn't necessarily mean we're a sinner so i hope all this is making sense i know i went on big ten it's it's just uh, it's such a psychologically strange dance where like father god would i go into the temple of the holy holies 
not even in my mind to ever go. Would I go and approach Yeshua and bother him and follow him? Even probably while he's pooping? Totally. That'd be me. So, yeah, I know they're one in the same. So, and, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that there is that for us. And uh, I don't know, maybe there, maybe that's a thing that I need to focus on more is, is coming more to Yeshua to be right with the father. Yeah. And, and that, that stereotypical state Christian statement, but I, I think it's more of that intimacy I was talking about. I, I feel like, I feel like Yeshua is our example and our guide and available yeah. to get us more right with the Father, mm -hmm. um, to send then, us the Holy Spirit to do it for us when we can't, to be there, to be there, as he says, as a helper. Um, and I feel like, I feel like maybe the ultimate goal is that we do get to a place where our linens are white enough <laughs> mm -hmm. to stand before the Holy of Holies. And it doesn't mean that we are high priests then. It just means we are, we have, we have, we have received that, that, that level of holiness and anointing. We have somehow gotten to, and now we get to stand in God's presence in a different way than we can now or here. I, I don't know. I, I, this, this, we're really no, 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 no. That's good. But here's the thing. This is, this is a thing where our human minds can't comprehend. So we're, I'm really glad my brother just said this. Here's the here's what the gospel says. What you just said, Alex. We are already washed that clean. We are already that white. Our sins are that gone. We are as white as snow and as as pure as old wool. Like we are already that way. But the the pill it's it's a hard pill for us to swallow. It's a, it's almost an impossible truth for us to believe because we still look at us in the mirror every day. We still look at the sinner. We still look at the thoughts that we struggle with. We still look at the the actions that we still know we stumble on possibly daily, right? So it's like like that's the part that's hard. But if we were to believe what Yeshua says, which is this is this is what I was saying a little bit earlier. If we were to believe the promises of God in the Bible that we are already washed clean by the blood of Yeshua, that does indeed allow us to come boldly to the throne of God. But we come with that blood on us, that therefore God's, if you will, God's eyes see us with no sin. That is what the Gospels tell us. This is, this is in Gospel of John. This is like, this is the part where we get the promises in John, which is why I keep referring to, I can't wait till we get the Gospel of John. It's just like, it, it, it's such a mind-blowing melt, impossible to fully really step into the promises of it. It's so good, right? That it's like, how can, how can anybody do it? How can anybody do it? So you, instead, you just come into the, uh, you just come into Christ and you just go, well, you said so, and so I'm going to do it. And if I get in trouble, I'll just like, well, you said, <laughs> so you, you get what I'm trying to say? Second Corinthians 5, 17, 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Yeshua HaMashiach and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit. Uh, I lost my place. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the world, the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God, for he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Yeah, exactly. We're already clean. Wrap that around your brain. Good luck. <laughs> Hallelujah. I think probably that is so confronting that we almost prefer the rags. We almost prefer to yeah. think of ourselves as the rags because if you think of yourself as pure white linen, yeah. oh, 
I don't know, maybe suddenly your thoughts change. <laughs> maybe suddenly your daily, daily conceptions of the world shift. So much so that it might become uncomfortable, to say the least. Um, we start looking for tabernacles to build, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so Lisa Bond says, and if we stumble, question, she's asking a question. So he, according to scripture, if we stumble, it is our job to 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 learn from the stumble and then keep going and improving right it does there's no measurement of how much we are called to improve we're called to improve because that is actually the definition of repent it's you change direction from the way of your sin so um let's say a stumble is oh. sin right so when we do not change direction from our sin we are not repenting not real repentance so all the Lord asks us to do is make some type of progress in him. But that's not a progress that we can truly make, which my brother Alex has testified about fasting. If he tries to fast for the sake of diet or for the sake of health, it's the most painful day. But if my brother, you know, in his testimony, and I testify of it too, if we do a fast and we give the fasting and the day onto the Lord, it's like we're not even hurting. We might be uncomfortable, but we're not like in that pain and agony, right? So anyways, that's, th that is how we're supposed to treat every stumble, right? We're supposed to just take it, go, okay, I did that. Now I got to do better. And then we get back on the horse. And it's so funny because that this got brought up, not by me, thank God. But this is actually what the meetup topic is. <laughs> this, this very conversation is a lot of what's going to be talked about at the meetup. Go ahead, brother. We're only halfway through the written comments, but I just want to say one thing. This you just this whole thing just sparked an analogy for me that is too difficult to uh, pass up. Um, if you're wearing a pure, beautiful white dress or white suit, and you go to the dinner table, all your thoughts are about, oh, I don't want to get stains on my suit. You're 100% focused on not ruining that beautiful white suit you've got or white dress you've got. And you're not going to mm -hmm. eat ketchup with your bare hands. You're not going to go nuts pasta. on the, yeah pasta. You're just going to be like, can I have like 55 bibs? In fact, food's not even going to look that pleasing to you because you've got this beautiful new dress. Mm -hmm. So if we think of ourselves as already wearing white linen, it's already wearing the holiness and pure pureness that Yeshua is. Is then mm -hmm. how how attractive is sin then? I would say even less attractive than the giant tomato meatballs uh, on your wedding day. Exactly. Exactly. But since we think of ourselves as people who are still in our workman outfit, dirty rags, whatever, you know, our our everyday shorts and black T-shirt that I like to wear. If we think of ourselves as that all the time, then we're happy to run to that table and chow down on those meatballs as fast as possible. We don't care. Oh, I got some stains on me. I don't care. It's just a crappy shirt. One day I'll be worthy to wear a white suit, but today's not that day. One day I'll be worthy to be at the wedding in my beautiful white dress, but today's not my wedding. Today I'm just I'm just the janitor here, so I'm gonna chow down on those meatballs. So if you walk every day as if you're wearing the wedding garments, the white wedding garments, how different would you behave? Definitely different. And that, my friends, is what they call holiness. That's what holiness is. When you are changed and you are made a new new responder, new actor into life. Very good. Thank you, brother. Mm. Beautiful. Ricardo, 91721. And the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a mute spirit, and whosoever he taketh him, he teareth him. Uh, where, wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straight straightway, 
uh, the spirit tear at him, and he fell on the ground in a, and wallowing, wallowed up foam, foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it again since this came on to him? Uh, and he said, oh, of, of child. Uh, it's this, uh, since he was a kid. And oftentimes he has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, how uh, have compassion on us and help us. Oh, awesome. I'm going to paint now the key moments of this, which stood up for me. So this is Ricardo making some notes. He says, which hath a mute spirit, Whoso, wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And when he saw him straight away, spirit teared him and fell on the ground in a, in a wallowed foaming. How long is it ago? And he said, of child. And oftentimes he hath cast him in the fire and in water. My first thought was, what if this was not a possessed person, but a case of epilepsy? What if the fact the spirit is mute might be in reality not a spirit, and this is why the spirit is not speaking mute? What if when the father says the spirit wanted to kill his son by throwing him in water or fire actually happened is that sometimes when this man had a seizure, fell into water or fire because he was near to water or fire. And disciples couldn't cast this out because indeed it was epilepsy. But then I totally ruled this idea out because Yeshua, when healing this man, says he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and entered no more into him, and Yeshua cannot lie. So this was definitely a spirit. This brought me to a second question. What if epilepsy is actually caused by possessing spirits? And this case was more difficult to cast out because this man's body was attacked since a child causing this disease and Yeshua, causing him this disease, and Yeshua needed to heal him and cast the spirit out at the same time. Paul wrote, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Maybe not all diseases, but reading this again, because this is told also in Matthew, maybe we think, made me think that in some cases, a disease might be more than just a bodily illness, but rather a reaction from the body to a spiritual, excuse me, attack or even a demonic possession. Hollywood made a dent on my brain about how someone possessed looks like. But if this is the case, modern medicine might be treating fire with fire as pharmacy and Greek medicine sorcery. Yeshua refers to this dumb spirit as this kind when he says this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Maybe there is a kind of spirit that causes diseases like epilepsy. Do you think about this while reading this verse? My answer is... My answer is yes. I am persuaded that diseases are directly associated to spirits. Um, to possession, no. Um, but yeah. Be and the only reason I say this is because the Bible is clear that diseases are a response to sin. And so Yeshua doesn't always say, I cast you out. Like that is that is a thing that I, I noted as well. He doesn't always say I cast you out. He just says you're healed. So is there a difference? Like, is there a difference? So I, I, I would say there is a difference between an illness and, and, and a possession or like you're saying. So I, I think you're asking the right questions, uh, Ricardo. And I think um, I do think that illness has some type of spiritual attachment, though, because according to the Bible, sickness is associated with sin. So. Good question. Oh, somebody else. Oh, no, no, no. You're the only person to talk about that one. Okay, good. Um, I love it. You guys give us great live comments. It's funny stuff, too, that you're saying. Um, there are ministries that, and, and I don't know if I'm in a disagreement with it. I'm just going to say this because it's, you know, a fellowship and we're just talking stuff here. There are ministries that believe that every single illness from a cold, uh, a rash on your skin or anything like that is some form of transference of a spiritual nature. So if you were to cast out any sickness or heal any sickness, you'd have to deal with the spiritual aspect of it. Um
Yeah, that there's a part of me that thinks that that is correct. And there's a part of me that thinks that it's very different to be possessed than to just have an illness. Uh, so the, the word possessed, which is why sometimes you hear me in my live videos, I talk about how I think very, very few people are possessed. I think very many people are, are demonically influenced, meaning that, you know, they're hearing the whispers in their ears and they're like, yeah, I like that. Or yeah, I believe that. So therefore they're influenced. And then they respond to that influence, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're possessed. So that's what that, I just want to kind of distinguish that. Yeah. Um, what comment are we on? We are on Karen Del Cunningham, 925. Okay. <clears throat> Karen Del Cunningham, 925. Uh, now when Yeshua saw the crowd was quickly growing larger, he commanded the demon saying, deaf and mute spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. Um, when Yeshua healed, he also spoke about those demons never returning. It troubles me how people seemingly get healed of cancer through chemo, for example. And I don't want to be ungrateful when I see that happen. But quite often, the cancer, demonic, demonic root in parentheses, returns worse than before. Reminds me of the house vacated by a spirit only to return with seven more. Mm -hmm. It would seem that if a vacuum is not filled up immediately with something else, the healed person could become worse off than before. We need so much to be seeking God for that complete continual filling with the Holy Spirit. I struggle with my reluctance to pray for healing if I perceive it to be a band-aid solution. Does anyone feel conflicted with regards to praying for the sick? Well, I, you know, it's never, it's scary. I mean, I, Praying for the sick is scary simply because you I fear, what if they don't get healed? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Does that mean my prayers suck? Does that mean my prayers aren't heard? Does that mean I'm not worthy of praying? Does that, what does it mean? There's all these doubts um, that are just sitting around going, when are you going to look at me? Hi, you know? <laughs> so, um... So praying for the sick is never, never easy. But the very, the few times... I've just I just testified this weekend of one time where I knew the prayer worked. Uh, a very dear family member of ours uh, had COVID and uh, was in really awful shape, and there was no reason to think why she would make it. Um, she health problems already, complications, lots of things going on that was just very bleak. And the only thing we had left, being at this time they were two thousand miles away from us, the only thing we had left was prayer, and we prayed, and I prayed once. I remember. And it didn't feel like it took. And I prayed again this time. I think this time it was with, with my wife. We prayed together. And it felt different. It felt like maybe it took. But you never know in that day or in that moment. And of course, our family member, she made it. And, um, and, I, and, and I talked to her about that actually this weekend. And I was able to tell her that. And, and she immediately said, oh, yeah, it was your prayers. How does she know that? I don't know. All I know, I, I just assume, well, she must say that because it was so bad that there's no reason why she should have made it. But she said it quite, quite very quickly to confirm the fact that it was the prayers that did it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember myself when I was in, uh, in the hospital with COVID. Thankfully, it wasn't as nearly as bad as I know some people had it. But it was bad enough for me to wind up in the hospital for one night. I remember the morning... Uh, the morning after I was there, uh, I remember waking up and, and feeling like there was a big giant window in the room and I felt like God showed up looking like this, leaning on my window and letting me know that I was gonna be okay. Do I remember what he looked like and what it felt like? It just felt like a big white cloud that was in shape of a man. Was it actually there? No, it was just something that I saw. And, and this is what I, and I felt better at, 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 as a result. And then I found out later that my brother had asked people on Yeshua Network to pray for me. And um, I actually, I don't even know if, if I ever saw those prayers very much. I think I did during that day. And I remember my friends telling me, oh, actually, my so one of my friends found out that I was sick because of the prayers because they saw them on Facebook. Um, anyway, I, I'm, a, I'm a sudden torrent of testimony today. Forgive me, but um, I hope it's useful to people. Just right. on the on the um, regarding praying for the sick, 
So I'm testifying that it works. And I'm testifying that even though I know it works, I'm still terrified of it. <laughs> so <laughs> terrified because I've also heard of plenty of situations where it didn't seem to work and people have complained that it didn't mm. work. Um, and those really hurt. Those really hurt. Especially when things don't wind up okay. Uh, somebody dies. Um, so, yeah, anyway, there's a whole lot of thoughts for you. Amen. Yeah, Good thoughts. <laughs> I will say, and you know, it might be, might be something to bring up at the meetup too, is might be actually useful. You know, I talk a lot about God's chosen men and how like there was every week there was literally, I, could, I can't even count how many miracles were being done every single week. And then the testimonies would come back the next Monday and be like, hey, all that stuff you guys prayed for us on, every single person come back. Every single person come back. Non-believer, new person, first time visiting. We lay hands on them. They were healed. They were fixed. They got what they needed, whatever it was, right? And we didn't pray like specific things like, Lord, let them have this job. We would say, Lord, let them have a job so they could pay their rent in time. Right. And sometimes they didn't get the job they were going for. They got a better job. Like, like it was things like that, but it happened every single week. Now I only say that. And I know you guys know that story. I only say that because we had a brother named Cameron and Cameron believed he was demonically possessed. And Cameron was with us from the very, pretty much close to the very beginning. He was probably member number like 20 or something like that, like early, like maybe even in the teens, super early. And in the three something years, four years, five years that we had our Bible study and the amount of times we prayed over him, he never received healing from these demonic attacks. Never. He, he didn't even have like moments. And, and uh, I, we asked many times, Lord, why are you healing everybody but not Cameron? And it's so funny that I'm, I, I hate to say it, but I wasn't thinking of Cameron. Uh, and I hardly would think I Cameron because I always think about all the glorious things, but I do remember that we had a brother who just wouldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't get past these demonic attacks he was having and it, it ripped many of us. And it really, it, it was a, it was a thread of doubt in all of us. When we went to go pray for people, it took Cameron being a part of our body of Christ caused us to always have a little bit of humility and a little bit of, we really need you, Lord, to be the one who gets this done, right? Because we knew because of Cameron that it wasn't in us. We knew that it wasn't just our faith alone that was doing the deed. It was like he, he was a reminder of us that we needed the Lord's will to, for it to be done or it wouldn't be done. And like I said, all other prayers legitimately were like always answered, but Cameron, we just couldn't get past. And and that and that's a whole thing that like would be worthy of talking about and, and dealing with, uh, you know, and, and including in a fellowship talk one day is 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 that type of thing. It's pretty interesting stuff. So, um, all right, Sarah Peterson. Um, see some live comments, but Amen, Danny. Absolutely, yes, God. That's the only way the pain goes away. I have that testimony too. Vicky says, sadly, no one will live forever in the flesh. And knowing that for me, I can only hope that I can die like Yeshua. Not saying I am in compassion, comparison to him in any way other than in death and dying in flesh. I got gotcha. you. Mary says, uh, what is this way? Nathan, some of us are suffering is for another purpose to the glory of God. Even the disciples asked about these things. Exactly. Exactly. Jennifer Reasons says... For Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Jennifer says, I can't even count the oh. testimonies from all the prayers on Yeshua Network prayer page that were answered. God has been so good. Hallelujah. Amen. It's awesome. Amen, amen. Mary says, reasons for sickness is complicated. It can be for many reasons. Belief plays into it. Uh, personal lifestyle, diet also plays in. Sometimes it's a spirit. Sometimes it's a curse. There are thorns in the flesh. There are examples of many different reasons for sickness throughout the Bible. Yeah, and Yeshua even tells us that some sickness is for God to be glorified, which nobody would imagine that. So that's pretty crazy. So, yeah. All right, Sarah Peterson, verse 29. He replies, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. I was thinking about how last week's EBRT, Nathan answered many 
uh, uh, Nathan answered my my other question about how Yeshua can heal anyone with just a word. But he uses controlled folly for our sakes when he is healing people. For this healing, the disciples did not have enough faith to heal the demon-possessed boy. Yeshua talks to them about prayer, and some manuscripts also mention fasting. I was thinking about how prayer and fasting are things that we as believers do in order to be set apart and holy for God. We pray and spend time with God and give up things during fasting. So I'm wondering if what Yeshua means by this is that our faith will be increased and we will not be defeated by the enemy or lack of faith. If we are living in holiness and are close to Yeshua, this seems to be a necessity for certain kinds of healings like this one. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I say, I am persuaded that when you fast or you deny yourself something, what you're doing is, is you are, it, that thing has become a holy thing, even if it's just for a day, right? You, you have said, Lord, I am giving this to you as an expression of my love, my gratitude, or my faith, all the above, right? So when you, when you, when you deny your flesh, you are also telling your flesh who is boss. Your brain is not the boss. Your flesh is not the boss. And these are the things that really lure us into sin. Like, would anybody say that it was your soul that ever lured you into sin? Or would you say that it's your flesh and your mind or your ego that lured you into sin? Your, the spirit of your essence of, of the human you've grown up to be from your circumstances, the choices you've made in your life, that leads you into sin. That hears a whisper in your ear, oh, this would be good. This would make you happy. This would fulfill you. This would satisfy you right now. If you could just do this, everything would be okay, right? These are all the, the, the kind of the lies the devil uses or the enemy uses or our flesh uses to try to get us to fall into to sin because that's what it wants to eat from. When we fast, we are saying, you are not in charge. The spirit of me is in charge. And when we fast unto the Lord, we're saying, and the one we surrender the charge to is the Lord God. And we ask the Holy Spirit to come in and take charge of that spirit, take charge of our life, take charge of our mind in our, in our, even the way we literally see the world, hear the world, the inner dialogue in our heads. So we surrender that over to the Lord. And, and I am of the persuasion that the more we fast, and I don't mean just stop eating food for a moment or a day or whatever. When you, 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 you might have a vice smoking cookies, M&Ms, you know, uh, pornography, whatever it is, you might have a vice that you can remove from your life and you, every day that that doesn't enter back into your life is a day that you have sanctified that part of your flesh and you've offered that part of your flesh over to the Lord, which means in that part of your flesh where sin was, which is what somebody had written too, there was, there's a void, right? So when you cast out a demon, if you cast out that temptation, if you cast out that desire, where if, if you don't fill it with the Holy Ghost, it's an empty room for that unpleasant thing, whether it's sugar, caffeine, sodas, cookies. I'm giving ridiculous examples, but, but in all honesty, this could very well be such a thing. If you don't fill it with the Holy Ghost, if you don't seek, to, oh, I'm feeling that desire for caffeine, I need to seek the Lord. I'm feeling that desire for cookies. I need to seek the Lord. If you don't do that, these things can enter and it's no longer about cookies. It's about cake and all sorts of stuff. Like, I know it sounds silly, but it's true. So I, I believe that what the Lord is telling us here, my persuasion, is that we start with something like don't eat any meals because it's very clear for our mind to understand. I'm not giving my flesh its nourishment. But instead, I'm consciously choosing to do this because I love the Lord and I want to show the Lord my love and my surrender to him. Very clear and understandable. But when life becomes more complicated and the layers of who we are get peeled back, we end up realizing that how quickly we snap at somebody. Uh, when we go to sarcasm, right, and, and, and instead of like honest truth or honest delivery. Right. When we when we we have these vices all over the place that we use to kind of prop us up in life and give us a way to navigate life. And in reality, what we have is a whole bunch of idols. That's reality. What we have, we have a whole bunch of things that own us. 
We do not own ourselves and Christ doesn't own us in those particular parts of our life. So therefore, when we go up to a particular illness or demonic force and we try to say, come out of this person, if we haven't cleaned out that portion of ourself, that demonic spirit may not leave because it's like, you don't have the right to tell me. And even if we're invoking the name Yeshua, sometimes it won't leave because we ourselves aren't believing in it. And our life is proving it because we haven't given up those things in our own life, right? We haven't fought those all, our own battles. So in reality, we're, we're almost, I hate to say it, but we're almost kind of mocking the use of Yeshua's name. We're, we're just kind of throwing it out there uh, willy-nilly, you know, um, half-heartedly, even if maybe no-heartedly. We're just maybe going through a routine, right? And and that's the danger of it. But if it, it, I hate to say it, but... If, if, if you if you've done the holiness challenge right you end up you end up it's on youtube if you end up doing it there's a whole bunch of things where your thoughts themselves your thoughts themselves can actually keep you from being a vessel that the lord could use in a circumstance so while they may be sitting there telling hey demon come out hey demon come out and it won't come out it's because they don't know what things they're still holding on to they don't know what what demons they're still fighting themselves and they may not think that they're fighting demons because they may look at it as they're just M&Ms. They're just Coca-Cola. It's just Diet Coke. It's not a demon. But to your faith and to your walk and to your potential, it is a demon. Because a demon is the definition of one that works in the spirit realm or in us to separate us from God or keep us from doing God's will. That's how I would define a demon. And so anything... Anything that has that stronghold on us is a demonic force. And that, that's why I believe these things don't get come, they don't come out. And you'll notice as the apostles grow and as they surrender more, even onto prison, even onto shipwrecks, even onto lashes and beatings, nothing they speak to won't come out. Even the man who has paralyzed legs, Peter says, I have no money, but grab your bedroll and stand up. Why? Because Peter had begun to get to that point where he had separated himself and got out of the way so that God could be used. It's interesting that as the apostles grow in their faith, you clearly see they diminish in their holding on to their life. It's a pretty remarkable thing. So, soapbox done. Great soapbox. Holy. You're Karen Del Cunningham, buddy. You're the next one, I think, right? Yes. Um... Yeah, um, so much today in this video. Holy moly, right, guys? Amazing. Mm. So much, so much. Um, Karen Dell Cunningham, but the disciples didn't have a clue what he meant and were too embarrassed to ask him to explain it. Mark 9.32. It's interesting to note in this chapter, sometimes the disciples ask questions of Yeshua and other times refrain from seeking clarity due to uh, fear, embarrassment, or shame. I ask myself, why were they embarrassed or afraid to ask him? I relate to them as I often don't want to appear stupid, unknowledgeable, and naive, when perhaps I think I should know. However, both children however, both children and childlike people ask lots of questions. I suspect pride is often involved in not wanting to appear stupid. I'm reminded of this scripture. If you think you know something you know not, as you ought to know. Um, what, what are you arguing about with this, with the religious scholars? He asked them, Mark 9, 16. I am seeing in these passages, Yeshua asked questions. Of course, he knew the answer because he knows everything, but perhaps he asked these questions as an example to us or to get us to ask ourselves things, ourselves, things like, why am I arguing? Why am I so faithless and unbelieving? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot here. There's so much. We could go on forever. I'll, I'll keep reading. There it really uh, Ricardo, is. Today's I know. just so That's rich. That's why I only gave us one chapter, dude. <laughs> it's like, it's be, there's no way we're doing two. Yeah. Nine, nine, nine deserves its own video, clearly. Uh, Mark 9, 
38 through 40. And John answered saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name and he follow, followeth us not. And we forbade him because he followeth not us. But Yeshua said, forbid him not. For there is no man which shall do miracles in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on part, is on our part. This got me thinking about when Yeshua said, many will say to me that in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And then I remember, this is what Yeshua also said. He that is not with me is against me, and he that is gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So this man John was talking about was not following them. I understand that this means the man in question was not a disciple, right? If this man was not against Yeshua and disciples, but he was on their part, why Yeshua says, he that is not with me is against me? What if Yeshua here last state, statement was referring to those who are not with him, but by rejection and not outside of him? That would make sense with the, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Being with Yeshua means picking up our cross and following him, right? Is this scattering abroad the iniquity that Yeshua means when he says, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquities? I'm going to keep reading. Let's, we'll get back. There you go. Let's, let's keep reading. After reading this all, I can totally relate with John here and why he asked that to Yeshua. John, you mean Mark? Or John? Oh, I'm sorry. John's the one I asked. I'm sorry. If I have an experience in the first person, the feeling of watching someone using his name for healing or for preaching, but realizing by the character and walk of the person that this person is just using his name, but not being a follower of him. Not sure about what John was feeling, but for me, this are a situation that make me cringe. And last weekend we talked about the, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. So mixed feelings indeed I have. And then while crossing referencing for this situation again, found again this by Paul. Thanks Esort again for the reminder. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the others of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel." And it really touched me what Paul said after this. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. I therein do rejoice, yeah, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayers and the supply of the spirit of Yeshua HaMashiach, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. So it seems that it is pretty normal to feel this way as John did and seems Paul too. But at the same time, this seems to reinforce the idea that we should focus in our own walk with him as a personal relationship with our father. What others do in his name is up to them with him. And what we are to make an example out of our walk and not having a condemning heart. Each will harvest what each sowed. And Paul also said after this, which seems to confirm all this thoughts. Quote, and in nothing terrified by your, your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. But to you of salvation and that of God. For on to you is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. So lesson learned. I hope got it. P.S. This means, Nathan, that you won't see me saying, oh, no, that dude again, inside joke with Nathan, maybe something with a different approach. I remember that comment. <laughs> and yes, uh, that this, this, is, this, is, this is what 
I was hoping for you, brother. This is great. This is a really wonderful comment and uh and amen, amen, amen. I, I honestly I couldn't be happier, which is just I these are the moments in EBRT where I personally feel like I've been waiting so long to have fellowship and I know I say this a bazillion trillion times on in these videos. I just to to have somebody else say these kind of words that you guys have said in this video, it's like 10 of 20 of them, but where you guys are like, Oh, this is what I know. So this is what I saw. Or this is what my realization is like, things like this. It's like, you only, I feel you really only get like the real light bulb. The real click goes on when you read it for yourself and you come into this awareness yourself. Somebody can't tell you this stuff. A human being cannot tell you this stuff. I mean, Yeshua himself told these guys and they're still not getting it. Yeshua tells us, right? So it's like, it just has to click. It has to go on. And when it does, it is so wonderful because it means that this is a new aspect of our fellowship that we get to talk about and have, and have the knowing that the person we're talking to had the same light bulb go on and, and it click. It doesn't mean we're better. I'm not trying to say that in case anybody out there is trying to get all legalistic. I'm saying is, is that it's nice for those of us who have these light bulbs that go on and we're like, I really wish I could talk to somebody about this. I really wish that I could have conversations like, you know, the one that Sarah left earlier in the, in the video where she's like, Did, uh, is this totally left field? Is this good? Cameron, same thing. Is this just, am I being silly? It's like, no, no, because there's so many of us that have these ideas and I, I know I'm so boxing on just a remnant of just my appreciation of EVRT. This is you guys. God bless you. Every single one of you. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Go for it, brother. Uh, no, EVRT, man. What a blessing. And um, uh, and Ricardo's this this very long comment is 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 a example of that blessing. And like so many today, just like my brother said, but um, yeah, you take two things here, Ricardo, that will seem on the surface contradictory and or maybe even three things. And yet you process through them. And also, given the fullness of everything that was talked about in this video, I believe we started today talking about the intimate relationship to Christ, intimate relationship to God. And then we come back here. You come back here in the end about talking about um, um, uh uh, prophesy, uh, uh, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. That part really sticks out to me. I never knew you. That is a very intimate thing to know someone, to truly know someone. And so, yeah. you know, your friends, you know, your relatives, you know, your spouses, your children, you know them about as well as you could possibly know anyone. Um, um, and, uh, and, and they're always familiar to you. And so here's what he's saying. I, the relationship that makes us intimate and familiar, I did not have with you. And by not having an intimate and familiar relationship with you, you're showing to me that you're workers of iniquity. That's what, I, that's what I'm reading from it today. And mm -hmm. uh, it does not at all contradict with the other statement saying, don't mess with, don't stop the man working in my name, even though he's not in the same group or following me now. And uh, right. and then it, just like you said, uh, Ricardo, I agree with you. It goes back to our prior video about trying to sit there in judgment of others. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Watch out! You might have a giant plank in your eye. And uh, and the joy here that you talk about how Paul goes. I may even see the fact that they're totally faking it, mm -hmm. but I don't care. It is not my job to care. Christ is being professed. The the Christ is being preached. Right. Exactly. What's in this man's heart that I maybe can tell because I have some experience more than he, um, that's not mine to share with everybody because the truth is he's doing the work that needs to be done. And if it so happens that that's where that man is in his walk today, uh, it might change in the future. Um, exactly. You know, and uh, just the humility of that, the humility of... We're all, you know, keeping your eye on the prize. Do actually what your king asks of you to do. Don't try to do extras. You know, there's there's the, uh, wait a second, I, I, you know, this is what happens. Knowledge puffs up ego, right? We try to do extras. We, we mm. get some understanding. We see somebody that is obviously without it, yet they're doing, they're doing very basically the right works. But we don't like it because they could do so much better or more, and they need to know this, and we come at them, and we judge them. And we and we get into this we get into this contest of who knows more, 
Suddenly the mm -hmm. work of the kingdom is not being done. It's two Christians arguing about scripture. Oops. Like, why is that okay? That's like you've done worse. By, by mm -hmm. coming at somebody to try and quote unquote enlighten them, really what you've done is you've knocked them off what they were prior doing prior, which is testifying in the, or, or preaching Christ. You know, which is, I think, wise. what my brother has been doing since I've known him is preaching to read the entire Bible. And that's pretty much where his preaching ends, unless we're fellowshipping. And then once we're fellowshipping, like we're, we get to do in the EBRT, we're fellowshipping from a place of all doing the same thing, reading together and, fe and yeah. knowing that we're here to fellowship. We're here specifically to talk about anything and everything that occurs in this process in a safe place to know that we are seeking we're seeking understanding uh, we're sharing uh, our testimonies etc etc so um, yeah. uh, this is this is just and what a work the Lord has done through it huh I mean what come on guys come on this is amazing <clears throat> indeed um, and so anyway last comment for today we ought Williams, Mark 9, 49, for everyone will be salted with fire and every sacrifice will be salted with salt. This struck me as a very odd sentence and I had to stop and think about it. I think I read it as we will all be preserved only by being refined in the fire. The fire burns away corruption and reveals that we need to sacrifice as an offering to God. Every sacrifice made is present preserved with a preservative, which is Yeshua. Also, salt can be used to extinguish fire, so maybe as we sacrifice our flesh, Yeshua will preserve us by removing the fire. How do you all read it? Rianne, I'm totally on your page. Um, I did love this. I did spend some time thinking about this because it's so cryptic and so weird, but not really. And so what I've come up with, if I may share, because this is the last comment, uh, what, what I was feeling is that... Um, is basically what you're saying for everyone shall be salted with fire made me think about how you know when you salt stuff you kind of sprinkle it like this and everyone will be salted with fire i was thinking the holy spirit the fire of the pentecost and 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 everyone will be salted with it and ev and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt so an offering in the temple mm -hmm. you, salt was put upon it so that it would be later eaten after it was it, after it was cooked um Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, what will you season it with? Have the salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. This is all in answering, I believe, the prior statement where he understood that they were having a squabble about who's the greater, who's going to be the leader. And uh, to me, this says that, um, that the real salt that you get to preserve yourself with is sacrifice. And I think you're picking up on that in your comment too. And that those who sacrifice get to keep their salt. And when you sacrifice, you have peace with one another. You're not seeking to have leadership or, or be glorified in each other. You are just seeking to serve. And you're keeping the salt to yourself. And if you... Uh, uh, what, what, I, I, think, I think I've said what I was going to say. I, I just... I, I remember it being clearer in my head before this whole... <laughs> wonderful video that's, of that's how i work bro yeah. i hear it much better in my head than what my mouth is yeah up yeah i now. had a i had a yeah but I, I think i think we're saying the same thing rian actually i hope i i hope i made sense just there <laughs> yeah I made, it yeah. makes sense i basically I, see I, salt as service and uh the way you keep it the way you stay seasoned is through sacrifice and that when the fire comes uh you are a good offering yeah I w if i may take a second to put this into uh, like uh, application well what i was talking about earlier like with the whole like sacrifice like uh fasting whatever you're giving up right not just food but fasting i just want to say that like this is a perfect example or this i believe is is god yeshua himself saying so we get refined we welcome the fire it refines us and then because we got refined 
we get salted again and Yeshua is the salt. The more the Holy Spirit is in us, the less likely we are to repeat that sin. The less likely we are that that dross will be still in us or return. Likely. But we can invite it back. We can pick up dirt along the way and so on and so forth. And the Bible talks about that. And that's what the washing of the feet is for. So there's a lot of things here where we... Um, where, the, where this scripture, I believe, is very applicable and, and a promise that if you allow the Lord to refine you and you make the fire not a consuming fire, because that's another thing that scriptures will talk about, but a refining fire, and you allow it to refine you, you welcome the refinement, then I believe this is a promise that Yeshua will then give you the salt to preserve you. I love what was said here. I really love that per, 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 uh, pres, preservance or pres, yeah, to be preserved. I love that concept because that's exactly how I perceive it is that when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, like really when you're filled with the Holy Ghost and really you're surrendering over to a moment to moment to moment, the Lord will constantly bring you refining fire. But those things that you've been refined from, you look back on some of them and you're just like, I don't even struggle with that anymore. And that's because of the Holy Spirit. That's that per, that's that salt preserve. And it's a promise so we can stand in it. And we know that it's coming when we go into the refining fire. We know that there is a promise salt preserve coming for us. So the fight will be harder. It will be less harder to fight later. And we'll get to stand in it. That's exactly what I want to say. Bam. Okay. Hope that, hope that analogy makes some sense. I, you guys... Real quick, yeah, go ahead. I think I'm trying to remember exactly how it appeared to me, so it makes more sense what I was saying. Um, sacrifice. Um, it, it, sacri so <laughs> the salt and sac salt and sacrifice are the same here for me in this statement. And what he's saying is, what happens when the salt loses its saltness? So when that good, when that salt is no longer salty, uh, it's when your sacrifice when your when your work stops being a sacrifice right it starts being sort of a sweetness like there is no more if there's no more sacrifice in the work there is no more salt so keep the salt in yourselves meaning continue to constantly sacrifice and give of yourself and have peace with one another because you are in the same but this actually goes back to what we've been talking about here uh have peace with one another realize that your true work here is to sacrifice something is to give something that's the salt that you're seasoned with and if you stop giving and then there is actually no salt anymore i hope that's th those are the feelings and notions i got from the uh, that i wanted to convey but I, it's every time i talk about it, it comes out weird <laughs> i'm having trouble by following my own thoughts on that i hope it made sense yeah it makes sense and uh, Ricardo, um, when we say preserve, uh, to your comment you posted live, that's what preserve means. So the food doesn't go bad. That's what that's what preserve means. Just in case, because I saw you posted it just now. So, uh, yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Salt does preserve, indeed. Um, there's a part of me that there's so many things I didn't get to talk about, and it's already three hours in. So, uh, I'm, I'm maybe I'll do another video about this chapter because there's so much here uh that i really wanted to also just highlight but maybe it'll come up again so i'll pray about it and we'll, we'll figure it out but you guys your comments your time your effort your fellowship with us tonight as always such a massive blessing together we are building an amazing tool that will last beyond our efforts and be a blessing on the many people who are picking up the bible and starting at the first word and reading through and your fellowship is becoming part of their lives as well. So thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you for supporting this ministry. And as always, be blessed. Be the blessing. And um, maybe we'll pick up next week if you have some thoughts and you pray on it and you find that. We can start know. the next week with it. Yeah. Maybe like we can to, do that. Yeah. I'd like to hear them. I'd like to, you know, see that play out. Well, I, there's something really important about the transfiguration. It's funny because last week you asked me and I said, oh, I'll wait until next week. And I, I didn't get into it because I was like, we're, we're going on such overtime and I could already see we're going on overtime. 
but um, it had to do with when I saw Mr. L transfigure. That's really you know? interesting. So, That's interesting. So, and I want to talk about how I believe this type of the devil always takes what Yeshua or God does and mimics, right? He does his own version of it. And so I believe if you remember in my testimonial series, you guys remember me talking about the magician's trick. And I believe that transfiguration is going to be a thing in the end times that will be a tool that will be used to cause people to basically just have their world shattered. And, and you look at how the three apostles had their reality shattered. And I believe that this is definitely going to be a tool that's going to be used in the future against humanity to shatter our, our reality and our, un, and, and just like our bearings. We, we won't be able to know where North is. We will not be able to know nothing, you know? So, um, so this is, this is the magician's trick I was talking about is this type of thing. Um, so anyways, but we'll talk about that maybe next week or, or something like that. So we'll, I'll pray about it, but. All right. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds interesting. Love you guys. And, uh, since we already said, be blessed and be the blessing. We'll see you next week. Yep. See you then, guys.